Uh, namaskar, this is Professor Aman Agarwal, and we are uh, yet here another on a webinar on the workshop of some faculty development program, which we are holding on the life with Corona. We will be beginning this another two minutes, uh, but in the meantime, I thought I will take this time to introduce our speaker. We have only one speaker who is left out, uh, Professor Dr. Pandav, who is left out. He was joining us another minute or so. We will be scheduling it the way it was scheduled. We have uh, we have the focus of life with Corona uh, as the structure because there is no pre or pro pre or post Corona. As most governments have said, we have to live with Corona, and as a result, we are talking about life with Corona, bringing you perspective of business, health, and governments. And as accordingly, we have called people who are experts who are gurus who have functioned in this domain for decades on this functionality to speak to you, giving that business perspective, health perspective, and the government's perspective uh, to you here. Uh, just to brief you before I introduce all the speakers, we are going to have uh, the plenary keynote address, which will be given by Dr. Kiran Bedi, who is the Honorable Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry, uh, India in South of India. She is uh, the first IPS, the Indian Police Services female officer uh, from 1972 batch. And she is the, she was the last posting was the Director General of Police in 2007, Bureau of Indian of Police Research Department. And she has done a lot of work on drugs, uh, taking care of people, women affairs and all. I will introduce her in a few seconds formally. Uh, she has some meeting which is going on, and as a result, she will be joining us towards the end. So she will be joining us around 7.45, 8 to give her address. So till that time, we will have all other speakers speak, and she will be speaking towards the end. And that's why it's a plenary address and not the opening address like we had for Dr. B.P. Singh the other day. The sequence of uh, speakers would be, as per the list, uh, I would, uh, except for one change, that we have with us the following speakers, Professor J.D. Agarwal, who is the Chairman of Indian Institute of Finance, Dr. Surinder Kathalia from Singapore, then Professor Dr. Deepak Vora, Ambassador of IFS and from India, then Prof. Dr. Blossom Kocher, Dr. Mohammad Halim Khansa, Mr. Miss Osa, Dr. Chandrakan Pandav, Mahesh Singh, and Professor Saurabh Agarwal. We will follow the same sequence, uh, with, with each one of them having about 10 to 15 minutes, well, I would say 10 minutes to speak, so that we can have some time for questions towards the end, which I wanted to ask all the speakers, and then open the house for questions and answers before we listen to Dr. Kiran Bedi. Like I know Osa would like to leave in between, you're welcome to leave in between and come back Osa, uh, accordingly as you like, or any other member of the speakers, I can understand they are senior people and have commitments, they are welcome to go and come, and we will be very honored if they stay throughout the session, as did all our speakers in the previous webinar, which we held two days back. I leave that to the speakers. They're welcome to go and come when they like, but I would like them to speak uh, for the period which I requested. Uh, the order would have a slight change that uh, since Professor J.D. Agarwal is an in-house member, I would be putting him at the end uh, before Saurabh speaks. And, uh, so I will begin with Dr. Surinder Katalia and then go on from there on. The whole focus of this is life with Corona in business, health and government. We are trying to bring in positivities. We have held almost about 70 plus webinars free of cost in the last two months. Almost one or two every day on various issues of life, essence of life, growth, viral uh, issues, Kashmir, various other issues, trust, uh, Professor Vora has given, and various other issues which are there. We have a large number of them lined up as well. To begin with today's, we would like to bring in the positive life of life with Corona because we have to live with it. And as I said in my webinar earlier today at the university, Dr. B. Bravo, Ambedkar University out of Agra, uh, that there is no pre and post because COVID, Corona has been there for 3,000 years and it may stay for another 3,000 years. So we need to learn to live with it and go forward with it. Uh, I would like to introduce before I speak, so I'll take another five, 10 minutes, I'm introducing the speakers briefly. Uh, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor, 
Dr. Kiran Bedi is the first woman in India to have joined the officer's rank of Indian Police Services. She has served in it for 35 years and moved up the highest rank as Director General Bureau of Police Research and Development Government of India. Dr. Bedi served as a police advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations in New York. She is recipient of the Ramon Magase Award and also the Asian Nobel Peace Award for bringing out a positive relationship between police and the people. Dr. Bedi is a law graduate, master's, and a PhD scholar from IIT Delhi with postdoctoral Nehru Fellowship. She is an author of several books such as I Dare, It's Always Possible, As I See Creative Leadership, and more. And this is one reason that I have seen her speak and known her for so long that I have heard her so much of positivity that I wanted to, her to bring the positivity. And, and hence, I requested her to deliver the keynote address. Dr. Bedi has been voted as the most admired and trusted woman in India by the Reader Digest, the Weeks magazine, and others over the years. She has a biopic of her life called the Yes, Madam, Sir, made by an Austrian filmmaker. She is running two NGOs, Navjyoti and Indian Vision Foundation, that reach out to marginalized sections of society in education, skill development, in urban and rural areas, as well as prisons. She is an academic and has been a visiting faculty with ICIF, IIF, a leading training institute in Malaysia. As of now, she has the following of more than 12 million followers on the social media, her Twitter handle, Dikiran Bedi. She assumed office as Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry on May 29, 2016, and is serving as an upright officer there. Uh, that is a brief introduction of our keynote speaker who would be speaking at 8 p.m. today. Uh, she would be joining us by 7.45 and then as soon as the things get over here, we will begin with her address. We have now the first speaker going to be Dr. Surinder Pathalia. I call him Suri as he's commonly known. I've known him for over almost two decades now. We came across meeting each other at the Asian Development Board of Governors meeting where he and his organization, which he was representing, who he was a founder of in 1996, the co-founder of Standard & Poor's ASEAN and South Asia. He was heading as the managing director. I would interact with him. He would host me. He would give me complimentary invites to luncheon meetings, which he would host at the ADB meeting. And I had the fortune of meeting and sitting on the special table, which he had by his side, always meeting the topmost people he had at his forums. And because of him, I could meet some of them there itself. But it was his love and care which always brought me to that forum and be part of his group and his friendship. He's also a member of the Board of Governors of the United World College of Southeast Asia, based out of Singapore. He's an Indian born, but he is now a Singapore national. But as, as we know, an Indian is always an Indian, wherever he may go. Indian direct, he is independent director to the Silent Foundation, the EFA Real Economy Trust, the RTHT Ranjan Menon Foundation, the Asian Paints International Peak Limited. He was formerly advisor board of the Corporate Governance and Financial Reporting Center, National University of Singapore, Singapore. Formerly also an executive chair member of the Investment Management Association of Singapore, which he left being the executive council when he retired or left the uh, surrendered his position as managing director of the Standard & Poor's. He is an honorable member and part of our family as well. So I have excess right, an extra right on him and his time, despite from his, from my friendship with him for 20 years, as a member of the advisory board, the Apex board, which guides the Indian Institute of Finance in terms of framing policies and activities of the Institute. Welcome, uh, Suri. We have after him, I will another four minutes before I introduce everybody and then I will go one after the other, everybody. We have uh, His Excellency, Professor Dr. Deepak Vora, Ambassador, Indian Foreign Services. He is Special Advisor to Prime Minister of Lesotho. He is Special Advisor to Prime Minister of Guinea Basu. He is Special Advisor to the Prime Minister of South Sudan. He is also Special Advisor to the Ladakh Autonomous Hill Development Council, Leh and Pargil. Formerly an Ambassador of India to Armenia, Georgia, South Sudan, Sudan, Poland, Lithuania. He's an honorary professor with the Indian Institute of Finance. More than that, 
He is like my godfather. He is my mentor. I look forward to him for his blessings every day. In every week, I speak to him at least two or three times, and it's always such a blessing. Thank you. I move on to another friend of mine who I met recently more often, Dr. Blossom Kosser. She is an entrepreneur, and recently, when I was going to interview her for one of my programs on the essence of life and growth, it was great to know that she is also a Kathak dancer. I knew about a golfer and being an entrepreneur, but I did not know that she had this feature of her being a Kathak dancer because I never saw her performance. Many of my friends who are dancers, classical dancers or ballet dancers, I've had the occasion and witnessed to visit their dance performances, but never of of uh, Blossom. But it's a pleasure. We can see her dance in the entrepreneurship field, and she's always dancing up and down here and there. Even during this time, telling her people, her staff, her customers how important they are. Each one of these sites. So I thought I wanted to have her here to be with us. She is the founder of Blossom Culture Aroma Magic. Uh, she is chairperson of Blossom Culture Group of Companies, and she is also doing large number of social activities. which i will not highlight and she has been recipient of large number of awards as well followed by i have another dynamic person who i interact and i on a philosophical level i learn a lot from him dr mohammad halim khan sir he is an ias officer a former secretary government of india he is uh, with he was with the ministry of finance a very upright officer and he has served the government ministry the ministry of defense and various other departments in the government of india and set things in order we are very proud to have him with us and he is always there whenever i need him for any support anything which i ask him for he is always there with me our following dr mohammad hanim khan we have another young dynamic beautiful girl a friend of mine who i have known through my sister younger sister dr yamini agarwal I don't know if she likes to be called a young girl, but I always see young girls, both Blossom and her, and with Yamini. All of them are young girls to me. Charming, beautiful young girls with beautiful smiles, very smiling smiles. Osa is the president of Sweden Africa Chamber. She is also the founder president of the GLSD Sweden, which is on leadership forum in sustainable development, following the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. she is consultant with jarkosov consultants ab and has serviced over 55 countries and governments through her consulting activities through her consulting unit she has formerly worked with the international labor organization the unhcp unca uncac which is both of them are part of the united nations and the world economic forum so she brings up that dynamic proportion of the international labor as well we are i hope we will be joined by dr uh soon dr chandrakant pandav dr chandrakant pandav is a former professor and head of the department of the center for communal medicine of all india institute of medical sciences which is the apex body of medicines and healthcare systems in india one of the government agencies he served as association for almost about 45 years and rose to the position of full professor and head of the department He is also currently the president of the ICCID, which is an iodine deficiency organization, and chairperson of the CNFM in India. He is she is also the regional coordinator of ING South Asia region, and he is also member of the National Council of Indian Nutritional Changes, which is a body under the Niti Aayog, by headed by another friend of mine, Rajiv Kumar, who is heading as the vice chairman of Niti Aayog, whom I have known for almost 25 years now as well, and I hope. to bring him in one of these panels as well sometime soon i have yet another young friend of mine a dynamic young guy who has been uh, traveling trotting all around the world for almost decades i met him through the saint swan university professor dr mahesh singh from hungary he is currently the director in innovations of the university of serge which is one of the old and fast growing universities uh Mahesh, I see you. Yes, I see you there. He is also professor of international economics at University of Sirs, Hungary. He was formerly with the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Change Policy at Hungary at the Ministry, and formerly director research and innovation at the European Regional Development Fund, Netherlands. Just before he took up this new assignment at the university, where he is looking at collaborations, building on research and innovation. 
and we are looking forward to some kind of collaboration with him i met him at the saint swan university which is again a conglomeration of large number of universities in godolo in hungary he was a host with others at the 50 year celebration and before we signed an mou and he was that time finishing his phd and he became he was already teaching as an assistant professor but finishing his phd as well at that time when we met 20 years back it's such a pleasure mahesh to welcome you as well i have professor jd agarwal who is going to be speaking after mahesh who is our chairman of the indian institute of finance and is also the distinguished professor of finance he is editor in chief of finance india and he is also been the president of india's nominee on pondicherry university and on university of delhi i form which are the apex bodies for regulation and creating framework he has been on members of various boards of of journals and has also has his name featured in the nobel laureate list a couple of years back way back in 2003 for a nobel prize of economics and the last speaker before professor yamini agarwal speaks and sums up our discussion today and then we will have the keynote by dr kiran bedi is professor dr saurabh agarwal saurabh will bring in both business education as well as health perspective he is currently the principal of ifs college of commerce and management studies he is member board of the employee state insurance corporation which is the largest body which gives insurance to employees government employees in the country which is under the ministry of labor employment government of india he is also member of the of the governing body of the dhanpat Tanga National Board of Workers Education and Development which is formally called CBWE Ministry of Labor and Employment the previous body runs the ESIC hospitals and he has been going to various hospitals even 15 days before the lockdown was announced witnessing and monitoring the hospitals ESI had set up in Goa and couple of other places in India which he is frequently inaugurating and and inspecting he is also a professor of accounting and finance and dean at of career development at indian institute of finance he has been a managing committee member for almost 6 years at the asochem the one of the largest chambers in the country he is also visiting professor at iim rohtak and faculty of management studies delhi university delhi and also a chair of finance india with this i will finish my introduction of all my speakers and i will go to suri in just a second before i the last word for people to know that please keep your audios and videos off we are observing all norms as advised by ministry of home affairs for conducting zoom meetings we will be switching on the audios of all speakers one by one everyone else is requested to keep off we will open the house for question answers towards the end and then people are welcome to ask questions we will have the session for 2 hours and we'll try to contain it within 2 hours and then the address by dr kiran bedi which may last for another 10 15 minutes at the end of the session i now move suri to bring in the international perspective a perspective of singapore and the world at large because he has been at the standard and poors which is an agency which not only rates countries but also rate companies and is a deciding factor for money flowing in and out of a country because what standard and poors and other agencies like moody's and all do affects the life of business like blossom runs the money which she gets if she takes from the banks and financial institution gets determined by agencies like standard and poors which suri has been heading i leave it to you now suri to present the view on life with corona business health and the namaskar and welcome uh, namaskar and welcome uh, good evening everyone greetings from singapore uh, first of all thank you aman for the kind introduction the kind words and to uh, indian institute of finance for this opportunity to share with you and everyone on the call today uh, my thoughts um, congratulations for the great work you're doing because you've put together a very busy program over uh, several weeks uh, to keep the community engaged uh, in things that are relevant to them now and going forward i have been asked to speak on life with corona what does this mean going forward for business health and government 
my experience is largely from Singapore and East Asia, and my comments will draw more on international and regional perspectives. I hope that these will be of relevance. They say that when one has to look ahead, one must always first look behind. When we do so, a few interesting themes will emerge today. We saw the virus first start off in China and East Asia. There were conflicting reports initially on the source, whether it's from a lab or from a wet market. It soon then spread on uh, to Europe, Italy uh, principally, which was uh, quite badly hit uh, and had a lot of uh, fatalities. And the Middle East, which surprised many of us here from East Asia. And then, of course, the next wave was the UK, US, and, and you know, India, and now we see even Brazil. What have we learned so far? Nobody has a perfect handle on the views and different theories that keep emerging, and that's possible because the virus itself is believed to be mutating. We first heard that there was no human-to-human -human transmission by WHO and others. We were then told that it was highly contagious relative to SARS, but the mortality was going to be lower. We were also told to wash our hands thoroughly, even by people like Sachin Tendulkar, to maintain social distance as that would help. Many governments and think tanks also talked about developing herd immunity, Sweden and U UK being among them. The latter, UK, of course, as we know, quickly dropped this concept when it became clear that the number of deaths would be excessive unless measures to contain it were aggressively pursued. China was the first to impose a lockdown. When it happened, it seemed draconian then. Others followed suit, New Zealand, Vietnam, Italy, UK, India, and so on. But for many, it was a bit too late. Lockdowns have been devastating on business and more so on people who have been affected socially, emotionally, and financially. We have seen governments being caught flat-footed, lack of essential supplies for healthcare professionals, ventilators, and that too in New York and the US. Food supply chains around the world have been disrupted. And we, are seeing pan we have seen panic buying behaviors, even in developed countries where we thought that such irrational behaviors were probably unthinkable. Schools and universities throughout the world have closed shop. People who could work from home are now working mainly from home. One aspect that fortunately functioned throughout was the banking and financial sector virtually all around the world. And as many of you know, Wall Street, which dropped sharply in March, has recovered much of the lost ground. Transportation, hotels, restaurants, brick and mortar retail, especially for discretionary and luxury spend, have been big losers in this crisis. But online services such as Amazon, Netflix, and supermarkets for food and essentials seem to be thriving. We have, as of this evening, 6.6 .6 million coronavirus cases globally and almost 400,000 dead. 3.2 million have recovered also so far, and the active cases are about 3 million. The highest deaths, surprisingly, have been in the U.S., over 100,000. To put in context, the U.S. The US has roughly about 50,000 fatalities due to flu annually. So this is a huge number for them. The United Kingdom has 40,000 deaths. As of this evening, India had almost 220,000 cases and 6,000 6, deaths. So the number of deaths in India is far lower than what we have seen in other markets. Now, what do we know about the virus? First, most of the deaths that have taken place have been amongst the elderly and those with chronic illnesses. Wearing masks particularly helped East Asia contain the spread early on. Vietnam has 97 million people and only 300 cases and zero deaths. 
Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, New Zealand all did well. While in the initial period, fever, cough, lack of taste and smells were symptoms of the virus, more recently we are finding that asymptomatic cases are proving to be very challenging because they are hard to track and the symptoms don't appear. But they, uh, they continue to affect and spread uh, even now in the community, particularly in Singapore. Yeah. W vaccines. A lot of organizations globally are working on a vaccine, but you know, as of now, there are no real breakthroughs. We, we've heard about the Oxford group teaming up with a number of institutions, including the Serum Institute in India. But you know, there has really been no concrete breakthrough. Most likely we might see something later part of the year. And even then we don't really know it will work. Dr. Fauci of the US has reportedly said that we don't even know if they will provide long-term immunity. With respect to a medical cure, hydrochloroquine, a lot of it came from India, remdesivir from California, and ivermectin, which is uh, an antifungal drug. Uh, we've seen reports all around the world of them working, but you know we have the finest brains of all time, and we yet cannot find a cure for something which can be exterminated by soap ex externally, but it gets difficult to kill when it enters our body. Now, that's really an irony. China was the first to reopen at the end of March. The rest of the world is opening up at, in various phases and at varying stages as we speak. The renowned uh, commentator Tom Friedman, author of The World is Flat, wrote an excellent op-ed in the New York Times at the end of February. He had that stage proposed a global lockdown of up to four weeks. He said that within this time, the sick and the elderly could be isolated, but the young must return to work and economies need to reopen. Looking ahead, in my view, four scenarios are possible. The first, the virus disappears one fine day, inexp inexplicably, and this happened with SARS in 2003. One fine day just disappeared. Sylvia Brown, uh, an author who died many years back, predicted in her book in 2008 that a pandemic virus would occur in 2020 and it would cause havoc worldwide. People would be wearing masks and so on. Uh, there would be a lot of fear, but that one fine day it would disappear. Let's hope this comes true, but you know we can't really bank on that. The second possibility is that a vaccine is found and it is effective. Uh, I was watching CNN this evening and it was saying that, uh, you know, the, the expert on CNN said that even if a vaccine came available to mobilize it and have people around the world vaccinated would take a long, long time, leave alone the production in large quantities of the vaccine that would be needed and then getting it to people uh, to be vaccinated. So we are at least six to 12 months away in a best case scenario if a vaccine is found. The third scenario is that we find a medical cure. This doesn't seem to be happening and it's probably because of lack of global cooperation to find a cure. Uh, because you know, we, have, we say we have the finest brains today relative to any time before in living memory, yeah? And yet we can't find a cure for something uh, that should, be, should not be so elusive. The fourth scenario is, as Aman started off, that nothing happens and Corona is here to stay. So given these scenarios, how should businesses and governments plan for the future? If the virus disappears overnight, we could expect the resumption of normal activity almost immediately, as happened after SARS. In calendar 2003, in the second half of that year was huge for business activity all around. Given the scale of disruption with the coronavirus this year, in my view, it will take us a lot longer to recover. The wound, the injury is deeper this time. The healing should therefore take much longer. 
Another factor that we can reflect on, that people may worldwide have gotten used to working online, working from home, uh, online learning, online purchasing, online viewing uh, of news and entertainment and so on. So some of the traditional work in office, study in college and reta retail experiences may change when things finally reopen. In my view, again, it's too early to tell exactly whether we will return to the ways of the past as we knew them. The younger generation today is much more tech savvy and may well prefer to work from home and lead the world in online activity. The second or third scenarios, and I'm going to deal with them together. If a vaccine comes through or a cure is found, we're probably going to see similar kind of uh, business and uh, social trends uh, as if SARS uh, disappeared, just like when SARS disappeared. But for these to occur, we are still some while away and that would probably occur when that cure or vaccine is found uh, and found to be effective. But you know, there is always a very real possibility that we are unable to rid ourselves of this wretched virus. What will happen then? I go back to Tom Friedman's article and he says that other than the elderly and the sick, everyone below 50 should be back at work. Those who are vulnerable amongst the elderly and the sick should be isolated and treated. They of course must stay home. The rest can and must go back to work. Schools and colleges must reopen. Now countries are going to be reluctant to open borders unless testing is more accurate and reliable and can be done quickly. In spite of that, uh, I should share a conversation that I had uh, with uh, some friends in Vietnam with whom I'm working on a project on a Vietnam bond market. And they told me that Vietnam is unlikely to allow people into the country until September next year. We're talking of September 2021. And this is a country with only 300 cases and zero deaths. So can you see the kind of paranoia that is there amongst governments on opening up borders? Uh, Singapore today has announced that Singapore and China will allow travel between the two countries for essential and business travel, but the conditions are very onerous and I won't go through them now. Again, all in-country activity, that means activity within a country should be resumed. Trade, including cross-border, should resume. In fact, global trade is the lifeline for virtually all countries around the world who have become so interdependent on each other. And the recoupling that Amman has referred to in previous conversations, I think it's a matter of time before that does, that does come back. Now in this scenario, governments should provide guidances to businesses, guidance to businesses and citizens on what are the acceptable standards of working in office, social distancing, wearing masks, and of course, increased testing of the virus and antibodies. In this new normal that we will see if we have to live with corona over the longer term, there are going to be winners. China saw a huge surge in domestic air travel last month. They call it revenge travel. Vietnam, which I talked about earlier, is now prom promoting domestic tourism because tourism forms a big part of its economy. I think India should take heart from these two trends because India has uh, domestic travel. It has domestic uh, places of huge tourism interest. And I think maybe Indians should lead the way and promote tourism. We are also going to see internet-based services thriving, essentials, durables, telemedicine, and of course, over the top streaming services. And India is doing very well with what it's doing on Amazon and so on in Amazon Prime and Netflix with streaming Bollywood movies and so on uh, and creating content. The other area which is closer to IIF is what happens if online education becomes the new norm. And 
an article that I read, and that's by virtue of being on the board of United uh, World College here in Singapore, that I had access to this, this uh, commentary. It said that what you're going to see in the higher education space is that the premium providers in the West, like Yale and Harvard and so on, may well be forced to offer their courses globally, but perhaps at lower price points. In their view, firms that provide low quality or at the lower end of the fee spectrum might well find themselves edged out in education. Now, what we know is, even in a small country uh, and a city like Singapore, is that if working from home becomes the new norm, there is going to be a glut of office space. People are going to prefer to work from homes and live in areas where they would prefer to live rather than the ones close to their place of work. A recent commentary talked about people migration that would take place. And it said that people are likely to migrate to places where they perceive, and this could be in the country, it doesn't have to be cross-border migration, it could be in country, where our people are more likely to move to places where they perceive healthcare to be good and food supply to be secure. So those two, two things seem to be playing a lot on people's minds. Now governments need to be prepared for these trends, these emerging trends, and see what impact it has on their policies. People are clearly going to seek healthy lifestyles, build immunity, and will want better work-life balance. The biggest challenge for the world, though, is going to be on jobs and job creation. Will unemployment go back to past levels? Probably not. So in my view, governments need to do three things in dealing with jobs and unemployment. First, Governments should encourage investment in new projects, especially those that will create jobs domestically. In the Indian context, it would be manufacturing, it could be jobs for tomorrow. And so that's the second point. Ensure that those who are unemployment, who are unemployed, get educated and reskilled for the jobs of tomorrow. And for this, people will also need to be open to adapt and to accept this new reality. Third, until such time as the investments and the new jobs opportunities are created, governments will have to ensure that everybody has food to eat and a roof over their heads. I mean, roti kapra makan is a basic in India and you know, that needs to be assured for everybody. And for a lot of governments around the world, this is currently being met through subsidies and handouts, which are leading to huge uh, fiscal deficits. We're going to find that governments will focus on healthcare, food security, education, and job creation. In closing, I'm going to say that the world has emerged stronger from every crisis in the past. I'm a big fan of the inventiveness and resilience of mankind to get us through this crisis as well. There will be some turbulence ahead, but the destination will always be within our reach. With that, let me close. Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Aman, let me pass it back to you. Thank you, uh, Suri. And uh, we will come back with you with questions once everyone has presented their views. And now after Suri, I'll go to uh, Honorable Professor Deepak Vora, His Excellency Deepak Vora. And I understand Professor Deepak Vora wants to make a presentation. So I, yeah, so he is starting his presentation. Can you, can you see the, the first slide, Aman? We can see this first slide. All right. Well, thank you very much, Professor Raman. Let me put on my glasses. Yep. My name is, if you want to give my full title, it is Ambassador Dr. Professor Lieutenant General Deepak Bora. So many titles, I don't know what to do with it. Um, thank you very much, Professor from Singapore. I was listening to you with considerable attention, which is why I switched off my video so that I could listen to you. Aman, your circular says that divorce rates are going up. When I got married 43 years ago, my mother gave me advice. She said, spend a lot of time together. Otherwise, your marriage will be in trouble. Now you're saying don't spend enough time, too much time together or your marriage will be in trouble. So the logic is reversed. 
we've had a very detailed erudite presentation on what government should do. Everybody wants government to do something, which is wonderful. I thought the move in, in, in the world was towards less government and more governance. But it seems to be coming back. Government should do this, government should do that, government is that and the other. So it seems that we are heading back to an era of big government. Now, in this very brief presentation for the next four or five minutes, I just want to share with you my own takeaways, personal, professional, and social from the uh, corona, from the Chinese virus. So may I begin the slideshow with your permission? Please. All right, here we go. Slideshow from beginning. Now take a look very quickly at the figures today. The world average deaths per million is 52. Belgium is 834. USA 328, etc., etc. China claims 3.5. Their figures are bogus. They lie through their teeth. Don't believe them. It's much, much higher. Italy is 556, UK 598, etc. You can see that in the developed world, they have floundered. They do not know how to deal with this, whatever the reasons, aging population, low immunity, whatever. But the facts, the figures are there. In India, we've reached 4.5, which is very, very disturbing. Now, the question, Aman, that I've been wondering about, how has our response been so effective? I've been thinking about this hard and long. How come we were able to help 123 countries, including the richest? The US president says we'll never forget India's help. India has been so great. Half of the world's countries, including resorts, the rich ones, have rushed to the IMF, the World Bank, the donors, for help. We haven't. Why not? We are carrying out the largest, excuse me, peacetime evacuation in history to bring back our stranded children from 31 countries. How are we able to do this? And when our pilots fly over hostile countries, the ATC there says, we are proud of you guys. Number five, we continue to see these warnings in the Western media that India's health system is going to be overwhelmed. It's going to collapse. It's repeated by their sidekicks in India. It hasn't happened so far. But this has got me thinking. So here's my personal learnings from the coronavirus. First, I've discovered my personal, my hidden talent for self-reliability. I've learned to make my bed. I'd never done that. I do it very well now. I tried cooking, but I burnt the, the, uh, the vegetables, so I've given that up. I've learned to iron my clothes. I haven't learned to cut my hair. This is why I'm looking like nothing on earth. But there's so many things I discovered that I am self, I could be self-reliable. I could rely on myself. Then I've upgraded my IT skills. I've learned Zoom. I've learned uh, Cisco. And now I'm using Namaste. Hello, um, say Namaste and so on and so forth. And communicating through different programs. Trying to understand also why nature is hitting back. Whatever the uh, experts will say, it's the Earth's way. Earth, planet Earth is closed for repair. Then I've rediscovered some aspects of Indian society that I had sometimes overlooked. You know, we're a very good people, Professor. Just see the kind of support we've given to the people, the so-called migrants, the churches, the gurdwaras, the temples, all reached out to these people. We heard that many of them were starving to death until we had some of them run over by a train because they were sleeping on the track. And then the image was not of starving people, but of all their food scattered on either side of the railway track. This you can take it from me. I moved as much as I could uh, despite the restrictions because I do get permission. And I've spoken to the immigrant. None of them is hungry. They are unhappy. Yes, they are jobless. Yes, but hungry? No, no, no. The only people who are hungry are sitting in the television studios in the Western world. So my, my pride in our society. We're very compassionate people, Aman, and I've seen this. This is my personal. And then my admiration, which I used to have for China, for their system, I'm afraid it's fallen through a hole in the floor. They are inveterate liars. Uh, the, initially, we just heard the professor tell us that the, whether it began in Wuhan, whether it was a conspiracy or it was um, involuntary, the fact is it started there. 
And then we have this racket in Geneva. It's called the Weird Health, or sorry, the World Health Organization. They played along with what the Chinese were saying. And then when the Chinese said, oh, it can be transmitted by human, they said, oh, sorry, it can be transmitted by human. I mean, this, this, it's become a joke. So these are my personal learnings that one should not really judge a country or any system by what they claim, but what the reality is in moments of crisis. What are my professional learnings? Aman, I'm privileged to serve three heads of government in Africa and two regional development councils in India. The first thing I've learned is that my physical presence is not essential. I can handle it sitting at home. I don't need to go to Ladakh. It costs money. They have to provide me accommodation. There's, there's so much of... Uh, of expenditure involved in this damage to nature each time an extra flight has to go to Ladakh. I realized that I can do it from here because the area that I uh, advise them on, which is rural development, national rejuvenation, I can do it sitting here. What I've also understood professionally, Aman, that in moments of crisis, in this conflict of profit versus people, it's the profit motive that seems to emerge stronger. I don't know if any of you has been following the curious case of this company called Sergi Sphere. It's a company started by an Indian, a fellow called Dr. Sapan Desai, somewhere in Illinois. And they claim to be specialists in metadata analytics for patients. He claims to have access to data of 1,200 hospitals, of which about 700 hospitals. He said that 97,000 patients was, was the, the number of people that they surveyed, they assessed. And he said that hydroxychloroquine actually increases the danger of mortality. As a result of which the weird health, I'm sorry, the World Health Organization immediately shut down um, human testing because the, this report by this company was published in Lancet and in the New England Medical Journal. So everybody thought this is very serious. The countries in Latin America also stopped human testing. The search for a, pretty much for some effective existing medicine came to a halt. And we asked ourselves the question, why did this happen? Particularly as now the Guardian and the magazine called Science have published reports that the whole thing is a scam. Uh, the number of people working for this company, Sergi Sphere, is three. One of them is a science fiction writer, and the second is an adult film actor, a model, a female model, acting in uh, uh, producing adult events. And that company claims to have access to 700 or use the data from 700 hospitals. So even in a moment like this, my professional learning is that profit seems to matter more than people. The third thing that I've learned that decisive leadership and talented human resource is a nation's most valuable asset. 28 countries, we have our doctors, our medical specialists, our health personnel helping them at their request because we have the human resource to be able to do it. And we've seen the importance of decisive leadership. When a person, when the head of government, whether it's my country or it's Singapore or any other says, this has to be done, it is done. Singapore was held up as a great example of how it was dealing with the virus till suddenly it was not dealing with the virus. And we, you know, the truth started to trickle out. I rediscovered aspects of Indian society that I had often overlooked. The compassionate nature of our people, the giving nature of our people, the willingness to share. And then the fifth, I have today much greater respect for our scientists, our medical personnel, our security forces. Professor Raman, I had never seen angels. I've seen them now in our hospital. They wear white coats. I've seen them. I've seen how we've responded. Any crisis brings out the best in us as a society. And the sixth professional thing, I don't know how many items you have in your house that are still useful and that are 75 years old. The UN system and its offspring are 75 years old. Time to bury them and say goodbye. We can't waste our time. The UN has been missing in action in this entire COVID trauma. So it has proved totally it's irrelevant. And then my social learnings. The first thing is, you might find this funny, but the Indian form of greeting, which is non-contactual, no contact, I find this the best. I've learned to travel only when it's essential. And we have learned that the people who really need assistance are those most in need. 
Of course, everybody is talking about reviving business because they create jobs and so on. But the first requirement would be those who are really desperate to focus on them. Prime Minister of India first said, you know, Jan hai to Jahan hai. If you have your life, then you have the world. Then he said, Jan bhi Jahan bhi. And he said, well, your life also and the world, your business also. It's important, I believe, to spend time together with family and friends. That has been my social learning. And then I've also learned how social media is used to manipulate people, to give out ideas, which are really something that data is manipulated. People are manipulated. And from what I have understood myself, I mean, I'm a member of a couple of groups. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. But I would say that roughly six out of 10 stories that I've seen on the social media is fake news, is fraud, is totally wrong. So this is the pledge that my wife of 43 years and I have made for the rest of our natural lives. We will never again buy anything made in China. Never, never, never. Not that it will matter to the Chinese, but it is our personal anguish at the way they have behaved. And then we will sponsor one girl child's education because education is the most important thing with an 85% rate of literacy. It has made a difference. We may not have the best universities, we may have the worst one, but 340 million kids in our schools and colleges and universities, the numbers speak for themselves. So we will sponsor for the rest of our natural lives, one girl child's education. We'd like to share whatever we have. Well beyond 2020, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, sons and daughters of India and of the world, the world will remember that China has given us an example of its power to hurt. But India has given the power of its example, not an example of its power, but the power of its example to heal. This is what many countries around the world appreciate. And for those of you who don't speak Hindi, I just wanted to say that song means the party is just starting. So Professor Raman, this is all that I wanted to share. These are my personal takeaways, my professional takeaways, it's social, that we will all be transformed. We'll all be changed. No virus ever dies. The plague virus is still running around somewhere in the jungles of Congo. It doesn't uh, affect human beings, but it's still around. And this hydroxychloroquine medicine, let me assure you that since I get it free from the government hospital, I have been taking it now for two months. I go for my regular exercise. I do what I have to. I haven't been impacted by the coronavirus. I get myself checked every two or three days. I have been taking it. But simply because it's produced in India and it's available for one or two rupees a tablet, it was hurting big pharma. That seems to be the most logical interpretation. They would rather sell a tablet for $100 rather than buy it for five cents. So this is my takeaway that even in moments of crisis, the profit motive continues to drive people. We have certainly abandoned that from our lives. I believe my wife and I, our children have emerged better, stronger people, and we face the future with confidence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Vora. Uh, if you can request you to kindly... Uh, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank now you. we move to Dr. Blossom Kocher uh, to bring in that business perspective. Uh, Blossom, uh, uh, just a second, we will be on you now. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yes, Blossom. Uh, okay. Yeah, hi. Okay. Hi. We are not able to see you. Just a second. Oh, not see me. How can you not see me? What has happened? Coming black now. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just get back to. Let me just do it. No, this has to go. Oh, we'll see you. One moment. Stop. The video is on. Everything is on. What happened? I don't know. Uh, you have to share the screen with us. Are you sharing it with us? Yeah, I just wait one moment. Sorry. Wait, wait a now. <laughs> share yes, content share or screen. share screen? Uh, share start screen. Video. Start video and share content or no? No, no share screen. Share screen. Okay. Where is it? Where is it? Maybe okay. your camera towards the back. Uh, maybe if we can. Okay. Which camera? This one. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. We are good. Perfect. <laughs> Lovely. So it's we right. come. Blossom, Blossom, your words, please. Thank you. And Aman, thank you. And for, for 
uh, this wonderful opportunity to be able to share my views on health and government and coronavirus. And before that, I would really like to congratulate you, Aman, for the wonderful work that you've been doing. And I've been watching all the, the videos and the, the positivity that you've been giving to all of us. It's really wonderful. And of course, the two speakers that were before me, they were really, really, really great. And I love what they were saying. I'm going to go on a different thing. Of course, I'm going to start off by telling you that like we talk on the coronavirus, I hadn't heard of the coronavirus about six months ago, like I think everybody else. But I remember meeting an astrologer. And this astrologer had told me very, very specifically, uh, the whole world is going to change. And they never knew what, you know, so he told me the whole world is going to change in about six months. And so from this eclipse that is happening on the 26th, you're going to have a new, it's going to be a new normal that's going to happen. Of course, I didn't believe, believe him. And then we had another one because astrologers saying something like that, it was really something else. So then after that, and so what happened is, but I just had this feeling that something was going to change. So I said, yeah, something is going to change, but nobody, nobody knew going to happen in this pandemic that that happened and it was really something else but uh, this has really changed the whole way that we have lived that is one thing I must say and like um, uh, Deepak Bora has said before this that it has really taught us how to look after ourselves to do our own things and to be self-reliant which again is very very important and I'm so happy that everybody are working towards this. It is also one thing, the other thing that this coronavirus has done is it has brought us together. It has really brought the family together. And whether we had differences or no differences, or we wanted our space, but it has brought us together and we are able to really cope with the whole world. And of course, uh, regarding the health and how the coronavirus is definitely going to stay. That is something that is going to be there. And we better get used to that till, of course, they can find something or it will just disappear, as Sylvia Brown had said. But otherwise, it is going to stay. And we have to get used to that. And one thing that we have to realize about this coronavirus is that we have to look after our health. Because I think the health is something that is most important and we have to look after our health. To, if we are healthy, everything else is going to come through. But of course, the lockdown was not so good. We are happy that it's lifted. But we also, I feel that we have to take care. Now that the lockdown is lifted, we have to take care even more. And like I was saying, we have to follow all those hygiene steps that are there. We should not think that it is not. Like I always, I tell everybody, you should look after yourself. Don't wait for someone else. Don't wait for someone else to put on a mask. You should put on your mask when you're going to meet someone. You should use your sanitizer that you take with you. And apart from that, I must say, in India, in the Ayurved, I'm going to talk more, a little more about the health because I deal with that. Now in India, in Ayurveda, we have some wonderful stuff and medicines, which I think it is just to build our immune system. Because if your immune system is good, everything else is really going to be good. And so we have these wonderful herbs like ashwagandha, like turmeric. So, you know, we should take them on a regular basis. We have to take vitamin C, which is good. And also amlaki, that is amla, which is one of the best forms of vitamin C. And it's there in our Ayurveda. And that is another thing. Exercise, absolutely must. I'm so happy that I see people, they are all jogging, they are all cycling, which is really fantastic. I see them around the block. Exercise, yoga, meditation is also another thing because it needs to calm you down and needs to raise your vibrations. And also the other thing is, of course, pranayam which we have to do because breathing, the whole thing is on breathing. So that is the other thing that, you know, I always say that we must follow. 
And of course, apart from that, now when once we've kept our health up, and since I am into aromatherapy, I really see, I really see that eucalyptus, which is available anywhere, it is available in the nilgiris, it's available anywhere. Eucalyptus is an antibacterial, and you can use it in your house, use it in your diffuser, use it anywhere you want. You can even use it under your feet, we say, so that after a bath, so that it's going to help. The other thing is basil, that's the Krishna Tulsi, which is fantastic, and we need to take that. That is all to build our immune system. But to keep away the virus, we really have to wear our masks. And the other thing which I have found, and really, I've been to the Kerala many times, and I've looked at them. Now, Kerala, you'll find that they used coconut oil. Now, coconut oil is something that is fantastic. Use coconut oil in your nostrils. You can put it up. You can put a little coconut oil there and you have to do a thing called oil pulling. Put some coconut oil in your mouth and just like kind of, you know, gargle. You don't need to swallow. After a few minutes, you spit it out. So that is really something that is going to protect because like, like we said, coconut oil and soap and water, the, and not only coconut oil, but also till oil, they really help to dis destroy the virus. Now speaking, after speaking about the health, now let's come to business. Yeah, now our business, of course, we had this lockdown and everything has been closed. But I must say, this has really been a time to change the whole thing. Like, you know, now we've gone more onto internet, we've gone more onto e-commerce, and it's really given, you, given us a new perspective and a new way of what we can do with the business, you know? So that is something that has really been very good for us. And so we have not stopped our work. Then we have the schools. So education has been going, we've been doing education on online. The only thing that we have faced a little problem and that also we are solving is the internet is not available in places like, you know, villages or more rural places. So we have been trying to solve that and I'm sure it's going to happen soon. And this is another thing that is there. So, and of course, now the lockdown is, is open and it's, it's good. And since we have salons and the beauty part of the business also is there, the service part, the social distancing is going through. And I really, one thing I must say, the Swatch Bharat, which the, our prime minister has been trying to put into practice till now. Now it is really in practice because people are working towards it, they're educating everybody and it's really getting going. So that is something that has really been how we have going, gone through with our business. But we are happy now that the factories and the other things are opening and we can start you know, but it, it's going to be limping back. This is what I say. And it's going to take some time. It can't just happen because there's that fear factor that has been created with a lot of people. So it will take a little more time. And I think maybe it will be a little more than six months, but you will see that. And it's only after, you know, six months maybe that we are going to see what is going to be the state of our business, which which way it's going to go. And what I can see now is it's education is there, you have internet, we have to be doing that. And of course, the other is um, e-commerce is definitely there. And the net and AI is going to take over a lot of things. But we, even in our factories, now we have been doing, our factory is like it can be automated completely but we have not automated it till now because we have to make that balance between the automa between automation and people, people's jobs. If we make it completely automatic, we won't be able to give them jobs and we are such a big country. So we have to create that balance. And the government, of course, they are doing what they can to help us, but I always feel they would, be, but it's up us to really go ahead and do something for ourselves. The government is doing something. They are trying, they're giving us packages, but whatever they're doing, they're doing it 
I must say, fantastically. And it's us that have to go ahead and do this whole thing that we have to do. It's been wonderful. And this break that we've had at home, like I have been doing a whole lot of courses and I've been doing a whole lot of other things, you know, with people. And I must say, I'm absolutely proud of India. The way they come up, the people of India come up and help everyone else, help the people around them, help them with whatever they have. It is really so, it is wonderful. And our healthcare, I think we are the best, really. The healthcare and the people who work there, they have been absolutely wonderful. And this is one thing I must say, the healthcare in India is, I say, after watching the whole thing, we are really the best. And I think everything is going to, once it's open, it's going to be there. The, the um, COVID is, it's not going to go. But I am absolutely sure we are going to come through this. We have come through so many things before. And we are going to come through this again. Thank you. Thank you, Blossom, uh, for that word. Uh, I would want you to later on share also some of the activities you are doing in terms of training your own staff and customers in terms of hygiene. I saw some pictures recently, okay. but we will take that up in the question answer because I thought we will reflect, but we'll take it up. But I would request you to go talk about that as well as to how you're doing because you are an industry which is going to be embowed with people within a few minutes of the lockdown being over because every one of us needs a haircut and a lot of things to be done. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you need to be upright uh, immediately in terms of hygiene and structures. Uh, along with various other industries. Now I move to Mohammad Haleem Khan Saab. Uh, Mohammad Haleem Khan Saab, uh, I would request uh, if you can maybe make your points as well now, please. Welcome. Just a second. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Am I audible? Yes. yes. Okay. So good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you, Professor Agrawal, for giving me this opportunity to uh, uh, be amongst uh, the international galaxy of uh, self-actualized, highly intellectual professionals here. And uh, I mean, after listening to the previous three speakers, um, I'm not sure I'm, whether I'm as confident I, as I used to uh, be before I started, uh, you know, my video. Anyway, so uh, uh, let me let me try to make uh, uh, you know things uh, the way it may not sound very interesting, but uh, that is the only way I look at things. So I thought I will uh, put uh, the whole issue the way I look at it. Now you have you have given the topic uh, life with corona. Am I right? Yes, correct. Now, now now life with corona can be you know visualized according to you know my formulation in three ways. One is the short term, then in the medium term, and the long run. Now long run uh, at this point of time probably if we start with long run uh, effects of uh, corona then I think we will be assuming so many things. So I will leave those uh, those aspects here. Uh, I will try to briefly touch upon the medium term implications. But uh, to begin with I will like to uh, uh, talk about the short term implications when we are living with corona. Now, uh, again, uh, this can again be uh, chronologically looked into. Uh, for example, when we started corona at the, uh, in China, China declared that they have got a virus. These are the, the, the aspects of the virus, etc. Uh, then uh, something happened between WHO and China. Some ping pong was played. And ultimately, WHO declared that it is a, going to be a pandemic. Uh, then we had one, one death. And then we had 22nd. Then uh, there was a self-imposed curfew as per the desire of the Prime, Honorable Prime Minister. And uh, so this is one area. The other area is from lockdown till today. 
that means first june when we uh, started unlock one so i i am also trying to leave these two aspects of it uh, you know the uh, when the lockdown started the prior to that and when the unlock one started between that area i am i am more keen to talk about uh, what how should it be played out uh, in the times to come and to look into in a uh, economic perspective i feel that there are three areas which one has to uh, peep into to try to understand okay what sort of shock this uh, corona episode has given to our economy now uh, broadly speaking i have tried to divide these shocks into three areas the demand shock the supply shock and the liquidity shock now the in normally developed economies find that when whenever there is a demand shock it is easier to get out of the demand shock but uh, in indian context it may not be all that uh, all that simple so even for a demand shock instead of saying that okay if i give you 2000 rupees distribute 2000 rupees in all the jandhan accounts etc etc then the demand the demand will uh, you know take a v shape and uh, and and probably one can live into the business as usual sense so uh, because uh, uh, see uh, there are there are a lot of uh, elasticity involved because there are there may be certain uh, consumption goods which have very very highly elastic and there are certain consumption uh, areas which are highly inelastic now if you are if, for example i will put it in a slightly uh, more uh, in easy words for example uh if you if you if you, uh, if you are consuming certain uh, for example toothpaste is finished now you have to replace it you can't you can't say that i will i will postpone buying toothpaste but if you are if you are looking for you know replacement of your four vehicle or upgrade from two wheeler to three wheeler then this demand can be probably uh, uh, back loaded so when i say that uh, the demand Uh, in demand curve in india and the developed economy is bound to be different uh, maybe in uk italy it may take a v shape once they have the money transferred into the accounts of the consumers unemployed small businesses but in india the demand curve may not take the v shape instead it might take a u shape and uh, because of the uh, because of the disruptions in the uh, labor informal labor especially uh, you will see that even on the supply side there there may not be the supplies may not resume just because you have unlocked it because there is so much of labor disruption in the process and this labor disruption may affect the formal sectors of production and informal sectors of production differently now wherever in the formal sector the, the the businesses have taken care of their employees during this lockdown period and they they have been able to retain them then the chances are that once it unlock unlock is uh, you know announced and and their and their uh, you know supply chain and their uh, uh, assembly suppliers their vendors are in line then 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 the production in the formal sector can take probably the v shape uh, assuming that the demand is not a constraint but in the informal sector where the, the labor has not been being uh, you know not taken care of because of the limitations of resources in the small sector or in the informal sector then the supply side will is going to take take, take a little while Uh, and again here the the curve may not be v shaped uh, it may be a u shaped the third area is the the, the liquidity now the uh, i must say that the uh, government and the central bank has taken a very 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 proactive stance to enhance the liquidity uh, one can always keep on arguing that you know that this this is not enough 
or this is not uh, uh, this is not coming through as a switch on switch off process but uh, i have i have said it earlier also and uh, i uh, i will not uh, i will be happy to repeat it that uh, the the stance of the central bank especially the declaration by the governor that they have done so much for enhancing the liquidity they have they they are doing so much and they are willing to uh, revisit it so if there are certain issues with regard to liquidity then the rbi has given a very positive signal so to that extent i am i am slightly uh, 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 say with some confidence that the liquidity may not be the uh, the, the the major issue when it comes to uh, coming back to the pre corona uh, days business uh, ambiance so this is this is what i feel is going to be the 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 business uh, areas then uh, then there will be there will be uh, the, some medium term implications for example you know let let me come back to uh, this demand side only uh, i remember in 2015 or 2016 and the economic survey declared that uh, there, there may be a need from switching over from anti poverty programs to universal basic income i i think the corona has uh, uh, has given a, a good uh, good uh, opportunity or a good occasion to to uh, visit that aspect and and see whether this universal basic income which was Uh, flagged in the year 2016 or probably if i remember correctly can can be put into effect so that the demand curve is not you know demand demand curves uh, you know is uh, takes a, a, a more as a looks more like a v shape rather than a u shape so, uh, uh, then there are certain other other uh, take aways from this uh, this uh, not a very desirable period which uh, indian economy has gone through uh, but, uh, but there are going to be certain uh, certain certain changes in the urban life for example uh, see uh, you might have noticed that those there are two type of families uh, in urban areas where the they, they, some families keep their domestic help with them and there are some which keep domestic families Uh, on a on a hourly basis now in those cases where the uh, i mean the hourly basis domestic help is taken i think this area is going to uh, give way to a totally uh, different type of uh, change uh, i think the people are going to go more for mechanization of uh, domestic uh, help they need and Uh, uh probably the, there will be some sort of a bell curve uh, for example you can say uh, you, if you recall when you used we used to get our uh, you know clothes stitch from a tailor uh, that used to be the common practice and the uh, buying of the ready mates was a little uh, um, you know the higher income uh, uh, privilege but now you will see that the bespoke the bespoke tailors are basically the the high highest income uh, consumers and the the uh, ready to eat or ready to wear clothes are more of a middle class uh, feature so i think in the domestic working also we are going to have similar things for example in the rural area especially uh, lower middle class and uh, and below most of the work is going to be done by the the households themselves uh, while in the middle income group the 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 prevalence of uh, uh, um, the mechanized help is going to prevail uh, and uh, sooner the robotics uh, takes this shape and there can be a domestic help in the form of uh, uh, robots then i think they are in the middle income group and the upper middle income group they are going to be availed of much more so this is going to be a new business area which may catch on sooner sooner
only i think probably in the uh, higher income groups and the very very wealthy group there will be uh, just like a bespoke tailor they will have domestic servants at home so this is the area urban life i think is going to change drastically after corona the third area which i will like to say which it is going to be in the institutional areas now this uh, the, uh, we have been always uh, uh, saying that the educational infrastructure is um, uh, requires a lot of investment etc uh, the the good teachers are there has to be more good teachers now with this uh, two three months uh, lockdown a uh, lot of lot of things are going to happen on the uh, in the cyber space so the result will be probably that the the infrastructure the hard infrastructure the the education which used to be a mixture of hard infrastructure and soft uh, uh, inputs probably this will get slightly more compartmentalized and in a school building where which used to take only 300 students probably they will divide it in such a way that in the, for the first three first three days x number of uh, 300 students one set of students will come and they will they will interact on, on a on, on, in a physical basis and for the remaining three days they will be served uh, 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 with the help of the the uh, the the internet or whatever so this there can be a supply Uh, uh you know there can be almost a you can say the if not doubling there uh, the extra availability of in uh, educational infrastructure overnight so this is one one area which i thought uh, uh, probably is going to work the third the third area which i find that uh, after this corona lockdown which can be of very immense value to our uh, in in uh, very rich uh, handicraft and uh, and the 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 uh, the informal sector production now why the informal sector production was uh, probably not not so easily easily able to attract the market because they didn't know how to market it but uh, with the easy availability and sooner hopefully there will be a 5g availability also in that case probably the 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 uh, tribal folk dances which do not have that much of uh, audience uh, suppose in a remote village of arunachal or say for example in some remote area of ladakh now they can also be you know uh, uh, create uh, the uh, the 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 software the the goods which can be sold on the net similarly there can be some handicraft people uh, initially the handicraft people we, we, we are not going to we are not we are, we are not getting the access to the market to the same extent but now i have seen uh, when last time i went to bareilly and uh, the, a friend of uh, i visited a, a friend of mine who's newly uh, uh, married son's wife she created a boutique on the net and she was getting orders from all over the world uh, for the bridal co- cost, uh, you know costumes and she was getting it produced in uh, bareilly and this these products were being um uh, through the couriers were sent uh, you know abroad with a good margin for her and with a good good earning for the the uh, the the artist artisans who are spread all over the, all over india so these are the couple of things which i thought um, i i must flag and uh, uh, rest i will come back whenever there are questions uh, where i can i can elaborate on what i have said thank you professor aman for giving me this opportunity we lost him aman it seems like we have uh, lost aman for the time being i'm happy so- to take over 
Uh, I think I'm next. Uh, that's what he just wrote to me. So what I will do is... Uh, Sorry, I put myself on mute. Go ahead. Hi, Aman. Osa here. I'm taking over. <laughs> Please take over. I thought that's what you wanted. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah, internet connections. Uh, do we all think that the internet connections worldwide should be improved so that when we get into a similar crisis next time, all the people of the world have access to internet. Yes. <laughs> so happy to be here uh, again with you. And uh, as I just explained to you, I have not prepared a speech or any presentations, but I'm very keen to uh, discuss this topic with you. Um, coming from a country like Sweden that has taken a very unusual uh, position uh, worldwide, uh, that is of n not having a lockdown and um, looking at looking at the whole pa pandemic as, as something that we all need to go through and that there is a curve that should be either like that or be flattened. So since the, uh, the crisis, I think as you all know, uh, since the crisis came to Sweden, which was in March, started a bit at the end of February, but it came to Sweden in March, uh, the uh, the government took a step back and listened to the experts and the experts said it's better to flatten the curve uh, we can close schools from nine, 16 to 19 people who can work from home should do that but otherwise life should go on as normal and that means that of course our economy has not been struck as hard as many other economies uh, we do have a lot of people that have been exposed to the virus and we have a lot of people who have had the virus. Uh, we have also a high number of people who have died from the virus, uh, but uh, we have to keep in mind that we are many people who have been exposed to it. I have been home in bed for two weeks, probably with the virus, all the symptoms were there. Uh, but I have not taken any tests to prove that because that was another advice coming from the from the experts that um, there's no point in taking the test uh, unless you are hospitalized. So they were focusing on um, creating the um, the readiness and the uh, the capacity to take care of those people who actually needed to be taken care of. And that was basically the vulnerable groups and the, the, the elder. Sweden is a very egalitarian country, meaning that we don't have a, any really rich people. We don't have any really poor people. So everybody has access to, uh, to uh, medical aid, which means that everyone who did catch the virus did have an opportunity to get hospitalized. Um, so now we are... Um, Today, we are in some parts of the country, for, for instance, the part where I am in Stockholm, we are now, the curve is almost going down, which means that uh, people are getting more relaxed. Uh, the recommendation has always been to keep a social distance, uh, to be careful. Spring is coming here, it's sunny, it's really warm outside. People are really want to go out, they're sick of you know, staying in their homes, which was quite easy when this all started because uh, we like when the sun comes out. Um, but also uh, we are at the situation where we, the big concern is not to build more hospital beds. Uh, so now, today, actually, the government said that we will uh, we will now focus on testing people. That will be a big focus now. Uh, that we will test people whether they have uh, if they have symptoms. If they uh, we will test them if they have the virus or not, because that was not done un unless you were hospitalized previously. And if you are not, if you if you uh, suspect that you have had the virus, like myself. My husband and my daughter, we have all, we, we, the three of us suspect that we have had it. And uh, now they're, they're going to make those tests available to the public as well at a small cost, uh, but, but still. And that is partly because they want to track down where it is, where it's been. And they also want us to, 
to live accordingly, uh, especially the people who are working in hospitals and so on. If you, if you are immune, you are not immune immune, but we will find out what that means. So generally in Sweden, uh, we, I believe that we had a good strategy. Um, the, big, the big mistake was that we underestimated uh, the, the homes for elderly people. The virus managed to get into the homes for holding, held elderly people through the people, uh, the staff who were working in that place because their children kept, kept going to school and so on. And they did not have enough protective uh, material. So we all feel that too many lives were, were lost in, in that sector of the society. Uh, I believe that has now been minimized those risks. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we in total, we had 4,000 people so far who have died in the virus, and that is on a population of 9 million. Um, since I'm the president of Sweden Africa Chamber, and we don't have Africa represented here, I also would like to give us a little bit of a global comparison, because whereas Sweden is very far ahead in this curve, uh, Africa, it, the virus reached Africa very late because they are not very exposed to international traveling. And they immediately went into lockdown. The government wanted to show that they had learned something from the Ebola crisis, etc. So the lockdown was immediate and it was total. And uh, I think the total of Africa has 1.2 billion people. And they also have 4,000 cases reported, which means that there have been very, very few p cases of people dying from uh, the virus in Africa. On the other hand, a lot of people are dying because of the virus. Uh, and that is because uh, uh, of, of a several reasons. Uh, there are many very poor people. And these people, um, they, there was a shortage of food in some of the countries already before. That shortage is much more severe now. Uh, the economy in the countries has gone have gone down Im immensely. Um, they are basically exporters of raw materials. Many of them of these countries are living on petrol, and you all know that the the price of petrol have, has gone down um, substantially. So the economies are not doing well. They are lacking forex. They cannot import med medicine for other trivial diseases. Uh, so I think where 4,000 people have died in this virus, during the same period, 300,000 people have died in AIDS during the same period, and 160,000 people have died in malaria, which is a curable disease, but basically because the healthcare system is crumbling now because of the, the virus of, of, of COVID-19 and because medication is not available. And the poor people are the ones that are hit uh, uh, the worst. And it's estimated that one million children will die uh, next year because of effects from this crisis. So uh, one, of the, and one of the things that I do in my work is to um, promote trade between Sweden and Africa. So I run a chamber of commerce where we we help Swedish businesses, uh, like everything from ABB to one-man shows, uh, go to take them to Africa, introduce them to our partners there. I've been working myself with market development in Africa for the past 30 years in 35 African countries. So uh, we have partners there and we make people meet. So what happens to trade now that people cannot meet? Uh, of course, we all see what is happening and um, the lockdown is not going to be lifted immediately in, in Africa. And when it is lifted, I don't think the Swedish people will be the first ones that will be allowed in for the simple reason that we have had a completely different strategy. So we have now come up with a concept, which I am very proud of, uh, which is called the virtual business missions. So we will make people meet anyway. Uh, we will have uh, uh, business missions where instead of going to the place, you save money, you save uh, fuel, you save energy, you save lives, 
And you can do a lot of things virtually if you have the right partners there. You can get, you can mobilize ministers to speak. You can, mo mo you can do a lot of company visits. Um, uh, Nairobi uh, uh, and Lagos, the traffic is almost like it. It's the same as in Delhi, basically. So it will take a whole day to go from one point to the other, do a company visit and come back. Now, with a virtual solution, you can do that company visit in two minutes. So uh, in many ways, the medium, the internet is actually quite more, much more effective when it comes to doing business in other countries. And of course, I believe, uh, we have spoken to our members and I don't think that most of them would actually close a deal after a kind of, this kind of a virtual business mission. But I think they will have a very clear picture. I mean, we're also going to do B2B meetings. And I think they will have a very clear peop picture of when they want to go, when they can go, who are they going to see and, for, uh, and what, are, what did they want out of that. So I think that is an outcome of this crisis that we have learned how to work differently. Uh, and I believe that these virtual business missions will actually uh, continue being around afterwards. Uh, I believe that children who have difficulties going to school for whatever reason will be able to do their schooling from home as a compliment. I believe, and I hear from, uh, I mean, I run my own business, but I hear from a lot of government agencies saying, you know, we don't have to go to the office and have meetings every day. Sometimes it's much more effective to just work from home and log into meetings. So I think those habits will continue after the COVID-19 uh, crisis. What else did you want me to talk about? Uh, help me, Aman. <laughs> we will have to start towards the end, maybe another five, 10 minutes when others speak. I have two, three questions before Dr. Kiran Bailey speaks. So we will keep that for that portion. Uh, then I'd okay. like to go on to the next uh, speaker of mine to deliberate for another five minutes or so. Thank you for that insight on 3D. And we don't have electricity running and that's why the internet lag was there when we could not. I was going between you and, uh, you know, Ali. Uh, in any case, now I move to uh, Professor Dr. Pandev, who comes from AIMS, from the medical fraternity. We can enlighten us both uh, from the medical fraternity and a global perspective, as he's been a whole global trotler for ages now. Uh, Dr. Pandev? Uh, Dr. Pandev, if you're there. We will uh, then go to Mahesh and then come back to Dr. Panda. Seems to be a technical snag there. Mahesh, if you're there, uh, I would like to uh, kindly give your talk. Uh, do I see you, Mahesh? Yes, just a second, Mahesh. Uh, Pandav, uh, Dr. Pandav has come. Let's uh, go with Dr. Pandav and then we'll go to Mahesh as we move forward. Dr. Pandav? Yeah, please. Just a second. We're trying to unmute you. Can you please unmute yourself? Yes. Namaskar. Yes, perfect. Namaskar. Sabse pehle aap sabko main namaskar karna chahta hu. But before I share my learnings in the last few days, let us pray for all those. Since I come, since I come from the Oriental Institute of Medical Sciences to Delhi, where I spent the last 45 years. Every cell of mine is fame. So let us pray for all those, my fellow colleagues, doctors, nurses, paraprofessional and support staff, drivers, sanitary staff, and those who were responsible for law and order. They have actually taken a conscious decision to ride into the valley of death. So first I would like to express my deep gratitude to them and pray for those who sacrificed their life. They stayed away from their home so we could live a life comfortably at our home. So let us let me let us start our prayers to them. Namaste, Namaskar, Namaskaram. In Hindi I will say then try to translate it in English. 
करोना करोना ये क्या किया तुमने चमत्कार करोना करोना ये क्या किया तुमने चमत्कार आजकल सारी दुनिया करती है एक दूसरे को नमस्कार आजकल सारी दुनिया करती है एक दूसरे को नमस्कार कोरोना व्हाट इज द दिस वंडर दैट यू हैव डन ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन यू नो दैट दीस डेज द बेस्ट फॉर द मोस्ट कॉमन एंड मोस्ट हाइजीनिक वे ऑफ ग्रीटिंग इज डूइंग नमस्कार सो नमस्ते हंसते गाते हो तो आप नमस्ते कहेंगे स्टूडेंट की बात हुई तो वो लोग कार से उतर आएंगे तो आप नमस्कार कहेंगे और अगर आप घर में सांबर रस्म बन रहे तो आप नमस्कार हम कहेंगे सी दीज आर द्री वेरिएशन ऑफ ग्रीटिंग तो इंग्लिश में वो गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून यू नो वेरी डल सो वी हैव नमस्ते नमस्कार एंड नमस्कारम लर्निंग्स आई हैव ऑलरेडी एक्सेप्टेड कोरोना वायरस एज माई गुरु एज माई टीचर and as i share my experiences with you i'll give evidence since i'm also a practitioner of evidence based medicine which i learned at the mcmaster university in canada way back in 90s in sanskrit we have six types of gurus in english you have sir and in england now they call it lord or my lord for number of reasons the first guru is adhyapak second is upadhyay third is acharya fourth is pandit fifth is drishta and sixth is guru and guru is the one who is able to awaken the wisdom in you wisdom leading you from darkness to light i think what has corona done my guru corona has done is as facilitated my leading leading me from darkness to light so what is the first learning the first learning corona has taught me as my guru is that it does not respect any age gender color caste creed or country it has transcended all the boundaries so in effect it has given me a very strong message that the world is a family the whole world is a family which is very well described in my ancient vedic scriptures vasudeva kutumbakam so that is the first thing i have learned from corona virus the second thing i've learned is that the planet earth does not only belong to human beings alone there is enough for everybody's need but for not for everybody's greed so says mahatma gandhi the planet earth belongs to mankind human beings it belongs to the animals it belongs to the trees flowers and plants and also it belongs to the inanimate things as well since i'm holding a mobile phone in my home and it belongs to all these people so i immediately got connected with my again ancient vedic scriptures that when we say any prayers before starting any any auspicious the prayers include that let there be peace and happiness for mankind let there be peace and happiness for animals let there be peace for happiness for plants fruits and trees and let there be peace for inanimate things so what this corona has done is is connected with me a lot with my proud ancient culture and heritage number 3 when you look at life it has helped me to transform the definition the world health organization definition of health it was stated in 1948 that health is a state of physical mental and social well being and not merely absence of disease or deformity what i over a period of time learned is the definition of holistic health the holistic has eight components physical health social health intellectual health emotional health environmental health economic health and occupational health so that takes into consideration a large number of di- dimensions besides physical mental and social and uh, i have worked out some of the examples to illustrate this broad based definition but it's time to step out with the traditional boundaries i think uh, uh, ambassador chopra said that you know this is going to be a new norm you have to step out from the old he talked about united nations it's time to say goodbye to it so i think it's time to say goodbye to the 
whole definition of the World Health Organization and introduced the holistic health. It also gave me a philosophical insight in terms of why do people behave the way they behave? So basically, in Indian philosophy says that we are originated from the same being. And when you are born on this earth, you have a choice. You have a choice either to follow a path of self-realization or self-actualization, or you have to follow a path of self-satisfaction. The self-satisfaction, again, Ambassador Chopra said, that that is the market part. You are guided by the shadrupu, anger, ego, greed, lust, jealousy. And all this is encapsulated in the thing called power. So I learned how choices are made and how important or what people will do anything to get power. And that's what has happened in my understanding that China wanted to be a powerful nation in the country. For what? Because it had a lot of greed and lust that needed to be satisfied. So I was trying to understand that why do human beings take such a decision? And looked at the evolution of the human brain. We have lost a large part of our amygdala and hippocampus, which is involved with emotional health. And the new neocortex has come in, which is more rational, more market oriented. We have lost that as a part of the evolution. Earlier, the purpose of creation was survival and reproduction. But over a time, as we moved over in the ladder of evolution, we came to be attracted by more worldly things. So the choice that one makes in life is very important. The Chinese made a choice to destroy systematically, comprehensively, in a point of no return, the world that it has made today to me. My philosophy, my Indian philosophy, takes me to the path of self-actualization and self-realization. And there is where I find importance of Guru. Guru is very important because it's my Guru which will going to give me a direction so that I go back to the Creator. We are all part of the Creator. In fact, when you say Namaskar, you're folding your two hands, holding them close to your chest. You're smiling and bowing. So when you say Namaskar, you are actually communicating and identifying and recognizing that God's element in each and every human being. We're all one. We might belong to different countries, different genders. We have a different body. But basically, we are part of that single person which has created us. So it helps us to realize that particular thing. But next, it helped me to realize the importance of time. In life, the most important resource is time, precious time. Possibly one may know how much money one has in bank, but you and I don't know how much time we have. And there was a very important message from Alexander the Great that when you give your part of your time, you give a part of your life. And with uncertainties of life that we are experiencing, what it is important message it is giving us, let us celebrate every moment because we don't know where will be the next moment. It has taught me the importance of why God has given us two hands, left hand and right hand. Left hand to help myself so that I am what I am. But most important, the right hand, the strong right hand to take care of the others, to take care of the others. So that's how I realized that why God has given us two hands. It has told me that what is the purpose of life? It has taught me what is the purpose of life. It's not happiness. It is not happiness. It is not relief from pain and suffering. It is not relief from pain and suffering. But the purpose of life is to be useful, to be honorable, to express sympathy, to experience empathy, and to eliminate the root cause of pain and suffering by compassion. So when you leave this world, you go with the feeling that you have done a lot for your brothers and sisters and made a, life, made a difference for their life. It has taught me that pain and suffering is a part of life. Like day and night, 
happiness and unhappiness pain and suffering is a part of life and all of us are going through deep agony and deep suffering both physically mentally and social that's how life is if you don't want to be to have suffer pain have pain and suffer in life you might as well go to the cemetery because those who lie in the cemetery are absolutely freed from pain and suffering the concept of cemetery also brings me to my mind which is the richest library in the world the richest library in the world is not the united states library but it is the cemetery which is the richest library why because what people have taken to the cemetery is their wisdom and i have a very simple equation today there is a lot of information we use planning for the goal by translating this information into knowledge with that knowledge you add experience and through knowledge plus experience the wisdom so i have decided that to express myself very lucidly and very clearly what i feel about it live fully and die empty live fully and die empty that's my new motto i want to experience share my experiences and the wisdom jokingly people say there are two kinds of people in this world those who are wise and those who are otherwise but in india we have a third category those who supervise for every two people we would need a supervisor so that's what i learned about pain and suffering the richest library in the world i also learned my ancient practice of ayurveda and yoga ayurveda is science of life it focuses on health promotion and health prevention what i learned at the all india institute of medical sciences new delhi was a medical education which was imposed by the colonials for the period of time ayurveda had a very ancient origin and in between in the medieval india we had a invasion by the moguls then the britishers came so it got decided to the back seat ayurveda means science of life what i studied in aims delhi is science of disease and hospitals are nothing else but custodians of disease so help me to understand and recognize the importance of the white way and the ancient practice of yoga what yoga is basically contributes to building of our humanity the various uh, asanas that are there the various breathing techniques that they basically they are trying to build up your humanity some of the ayurvedic preparations that are there in terms of chavan prash uh, tulsi in terms of ashwagandha buluti these are immunomodulators they have been there for ages right now we are doing a systematic trial to understand the efficacy effectiveness and efficiency of ayurvedic preparations in building up your immunity that was missing and it's great opportunity for me to contribute what i learned in mcmaster university of kerala so that we can give a evidence in terms of randomized controlled trials the gold standard of determining the effectiveness of any intervention it just taught me that i've got a lot of degrees in life a lot of degrees but recently in the last 60 days i got some more degrees first is called zp z zp i know how to do jhadu pucha second degree is i know now kd kapde dhona third is i know how to do sk sabji katna fourth is i know how to do kapde dhona so these are the new degrees i acquired in the last 60 days but most important degree i have acquired is not b commerce but b calm b calm finally i would conclude by saying that as by a story we i come from a culture which makes a point by telling a story and this is the story of a hunter the pigeons the crow and the rat hunter came out his went to the forest and he is very keen to catch pigeons that day so he had strewn a lot of maize grains on the ground a flock of pigeons came from the sky they were hungry so they got landed up near the tree where the lot of maize was given and they were busy eating that they didn't realize that this was the trap set by the hunter trap set by the hunter so the chief of the pigeons said listen we have only one way to live otherwise we will become a part of his dinner table we don't his dinner table for days to come everybody said yes we'll do you we'll do what we whatever you tell us 
said, just bite your beak to the net of the net which the hunter has thrown and let's fly together. So we are all together. The pigeons bit their, with their beak, bit the net and they fly. And if you have to fly, you have to fly in one direction. So we are made friends. We are, we, are, we are still waiting for our rat friends. In fact, this year is supposed to be the year of China, Chinese rat year. That's why we're living like rats by this. Uh, all the rats, ratting and army, they bit the net and they all feed. They all feed. I also learned that how to be passionate towards especially animals. The pet, I'm a pet lover. We had a Labrador for 16 years. And the kind of solace, the kind of uh, counseling, the kind of warm, the kind of unconditional love was incredible. In fact, all of us were very disturbed today when we heard the story of two elephants that were killed in most uh, atrocious way in Kerala. Most atrocious. Because what I see in myself, I see in the elephant. That this planet belongs to them. So respect for animals, especially dogs, cats, which makes a lot of difference. In fact, uh, when I was having my dog for 16 years, my pet prescription was have a pet. So Amman and uh, JD uncle, thank you so much for giving this opportunity. Uh, I've seen, we have been neighbors. I love thy neighbors, I love you all. And you're doing amazing work, amazing work, which I'll submit in one equation, E equal to F. E equal to F. That is education equal to future. And that is what your institute is doing so thoroughly, so professionally, involving people from different walks of life and trying to give a perspective as from different points of experiences, wisdom. So thank you so much uh, to Agarwal family for creating this opportunity. And of course, uh, my colleague from Sweden said, let, there be, let us all be connected by the internet. And I would end by what Abdul Kalam said. Mahatma Gandhi always said that he was great profounder and supporter of Gram Swaraj. That's all going to happen. We're back to Gram Swaraj. But my beloved, beloved president, APJ Abdul Kalam said, we'll have to do Pura with that. What is P-U-R-A? We'll have to provide urban amenities in rural areas. That's the difference we're going to make. Then only we can move from education to future. Aman, Dhanyavad Dina Vahad Tartaro, Aapne Hame Is Samwad Ka Mauka Diya, Dhanyavad Is Samwad Ke Liye. Thank you and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll now move to Dr. Mahesh Singh. Uh, Dr. Singh, if you can present your views. Uh, we are honored that Dr. Tinveri has joined and we would like if we, all the three speakers can speak before we can hear her keynote address. I've requested her for five, ten minutes in excess because she was supposed to speak at eight o'clock sharp. But then, uh, sorry for being a little delayed in our own schedule. Uh, I would request Mahesh to speak, and then we have a little speakers to speak before uh, Dr. Kiran Bedi ji gives her keynote address. Mahesh, go ahead, please. Namaskar, uh, and greetings from Hungary. After life with COVID-19, it's a very interesting topic. After 10 years of serving the ministry, uh, I actually are born in India, but I'm Hungarian citizen and also a Dutch citizen. Uh, I served 10 years in the ministry. Uh, my previous workplace was uh, European Regional Development Fund as an director. And um, yeah, I arrived to Hungary back to my country uh, on 1st of March during the COVID-19. At that point, there was no any case in Hungary. So I, was, I joined the University of Szeged as a director for research and innovation. Uh, but from first day, despite the lockdown here as well, from first day till now, I, every day I was going to my workplace and I'm very fortunate that um, I utilized my time rather watching TV or news about the COVID or this and that. I utilized my time uh, in a very fruitful way. Uh, a brief about uh, my university, the University of Szeged, founded in uh, 1581. It's a very old university. 
and very famous for uh, um, uh, for health science. Actually, it's uh, we have more than uh, thirty thousand students out of that. We have uh, six thousand uh, foreign students. We have the best medical uh, faculty because of uh, our rector. Uh, once he was a rector, his name. A professor Albert St. George, who invented vitamin C. And he received the Nobel Award in 1937 for that. So I'm fortunate that I'm working still on in his building, in his office actually, right now. Um, what I did during this whole COVID as a director for uh, uh, European uh, Research Regional Development Fund. I have lots of relations, lots of uh, my colleagues are still working for the European Commission. So I, I established one UGLO program, uh, which is called uh, European University uh, for Global Health. And uh, in this UGLO program, uh, there are uh, many universities, also from uh, Sweden, two universities, uh, Lund University, uh, KTH, uh, LMU from Munich, Munich University, University of paris Saclay and Porto University uh, from uh, uh, Portugal. And our university, we are the partners in the consortium. And in the last three months, day and night, we worked on uh, several emergency calls because uh, European Commission uh, um, announced several emergency calls and uh, we were fortunate enough to take part in all those uh, projects. So in the last three months, we won 37 altogether project, EU-funded project. And uh, still, I'm working from morning till uh, late evening. Uh, tell you very frankly, all our colleagues are from a different university all around Europe. Uh, we worked very hard, and uh, we didn't even talk about um, any issues related with the COVID because, uh, yeah, we we just. Uh, writing the proposals. We want several uh, projects. Our uh, university is doing uh, fantastic. So yeah, um, so I have no any idea regarding any uh, COVID issues, uh, uh, what's going on, because I'm not allowed to say anything about uh, Hungarian uh, government side. Uh, I can only answer any kind of question. I, I'm also very thankful for Professor Aman that uh, from my alma mater institution, St. Istvan University, Professor J.D. Agrawal, he's honorary doctorate from our university, from my alma mater. Uh, I'm very happy and pleased that uh, you invited me for this. Uh, any kind of question, if you have, uh, I'm ready to answer. Still, I'm sure. working while... Uh, yes, uh, we will now listen to, if you don't mind, we'll give it time for about 10 minutes to Professor J.D. Agarwal. And then uh, Sara will listen after Dr. Kiran Bedi has spoken. So we will uh, start uh, just a second. So it was only from her office only. So we will have Dr. Kiran Bedi speak at 8.15 exact sharp. But for next 10 minutes, I will request Professor J.D. Agarwal to uh, present his views now uh, so that uh, we can have him and then Saurabh and Yamini will have after Dr. Kiran Bedi has spoken. But we will just uh, go to Professor J.D. Agarwal for his view. Just a second. Thank you. Yes, I see him there. Just a second. Yes. Just a second. Is there a backdrop? Just a second, sir. Is there a backdrop? Your audio. It's a matter of privilege to listen to some of the very prominent people on how to live corona or how to live 
after corona we had great time you are i think it's been a long time i have had to see him virtually today then we have with us my old friend deepak mohra speaking to us and giving us an excellent presentation we have with us bis blossom cocker nidhi bodhina hua and also we had with uh, us asa darshak mohammad halim khan and dr chandrakant panda mahesh is a long time i met you when i was awarded a delit at the saint swan university in hungary it was really a pleasure to you meet you again i and it was really a privilege for me to listen now the question before us is how to live with corona or how to live after corona corona as a pandemic has created serious disruptions in the whole economy now in such situations millions of people have been affected around the whole world this is one of the most serious problems because nobody could find out what exactly is this corona how is it emerging where from is it emerging how is it affecting and so on and so forth a lots of situations have been created we have been told that this is because of this and this is because of that well the point here which is very important is how do we live with it who says that corona is going to live if that is so and till at least till we find out a vaccine and it might take some time to find out a vaccine for us now till that time are we likely to kill the whole economy world bank and the estimates indicate that the world economy is likely to contract by about 3.2% rbi says india is also likely to contract and its growth rate might you know not be so good we might get into de depression the government has taken several good steps particularly one step which they have taken is to have a 20 lakh crore you know uh to be given to the public so that the economy can be revived they have introduced large scale the economic reforms particularly in the area of agriculture and the rural economy first time in india we have found that the labor has been recognized an important factor of production otherwise nobody ever in the last 70 years 73 years cared for the labor i think these are some of the important aspects which we have seen it has also been seen after particularly sain bag where people were start started talking oh what is the government doing they can't remove even 40 or 50 people who are sitting over there and creating problems the whole blocking the whole road i think the government in the last two months have shown there exists a government and i think this is very important government exists government has power it can put 330 crore people in their own houses and lock them down there economy can be locked down the government is so powerful i think we have realized this after this now the question which comes to us is how and how are we going to live let us say that there are three aspects one is the micro level another is a macro level the third one is at the international level now if we begin from the world point of view we find the economies are likely to be reshaped transformed changed there may be changes in international relations among countries there may be changes in terms of trade in terms of businesses in terms of investment and there may be transformations which might be taking all over the world we might see there will be large scale capital movement from one country to another and there may be countries who might be trying to chase investment from different parts of the world now who would win and who would lose such investment is a different matter 
there might be changes at the international relation level in terms of international relations between the countries and that is what probably is to live with corona that would affect our life if we come to the macro level changes we might find that the government has already been done a lot 20 lakh crore relief which has been provided both by the government of india ministry of finance and also by the reserve bank of india clearly indicate that the government is very serious in order to sur survive to reduce the possibility of deep recession in the country and also if possible to make it grow the policy changes which are taking place in the country which is something very very essential i think the government is very well seized about the issues which have emerged now how do we live with this corona at the macro level i think agriculture rural economy the changes ah there was too much of control over agriculture i as a farmer could not produce i produce and i could not sell go to the agriculture market now that is kind of control and that existed for so many long years decades in this country i think those changes are really requ were required now a farmer will will be free to produce and sell and sell anywhere in within the local markets within the country in different states or even export abroad i think that would probably double their incomes the labor over 10 or 12 crore people who moved from one place to another went back to their own towns or cities or their own villages are likely to contribute tremendously towards the growth of both the agriculture and the rural development they are living with their parents socially they are living with their relatives they are living where they were born where they were brought up and where they need to contribute we find there may be an agriculture growth rate of about 6% in the country during this corona period one area which was not locked down by the government very sensibly was the agriculture and i think the government has taken right kind of steps and i think this is something which is very important at the macro level body fiscal policy changes monetary policy changes are taking place banks are coming forward to give grants loans and helping people even with the government guarantee with no repayment for one year and so on so forth and i think these are some of the aspects which are very important now if we come to the micro level at an individual level we find there are going to be changes a person and as well as education has to be considered to be based upon four pillars of life one is dharma the second is art the third is calm and the fourth is moksha i think corona has made us to think both the dharma and the moksha we were too much concentrating on art and calm we were too much all over the world countries were bothered about or concerned about one thing and that is the growth how much they were chasing every country was chasing growth i think very rarely people were concerned about economic development the development of the people the welfare of the people and anybody who ever thought about the welfare of the people they were considered to be socialist or communist
that uh, we get those who are left out to, to finish their talk, and then we will end this session. Uh, uh, Professor Agarwal, uh, I will put you on spot. Yes. <laughs> I think we'll, we'll continue in the meantime. We had a, an opportunity to listen to Dr. Kiran Bedi. Uh, in my opinion, the government has done its best and is doing very well in order to revive the economy to control the deep recession if possible. It has brought about a lot of it has brought about a lot of transformation. We find that after lots of disruptions, there may be renovation of the whole economy. People will be more creative, innovative after the government's large scale pronouncements and in terms of financial and banking reforms, which have been introduced, agricultural reforms. Now it is the job of the people of the country. I remember a quote which Professor Mr. Kennedy talked about. Ask not what the government can do for you. Ask for what you can do for the government. I think this is something which is very important. As of now, we find almost every section of society, every individual is desiring from the government, be it a state government or the central government, that they should give this and they should give that. Now that probably is fine. Government is doing its best. State governments are doing their best. But at the same time, the people need to really do their best to do this. We need to really understand that it is equally our responsibility as citizens of the country to ensure that we are safe. We follow the rules of, which have been laid down by the government. We maintain physical and social distancing we carry on all those activities as per the guidelines of the government. Once we do that, our responsibility is to ensure that we work harder. We work so hard that our economy does not fall. It does not contract. If it cannot, you know, have a growth, at least it should be at the same level. We, as individuals, particularly when about 50, 45 crore people are labor. 30, 35% people are below poverty line. There are people who, are, who have been affected, about 80 to 85% people have been affected because of the lockdown, economically, psychologically, socially. Now, how do we really make it up? I say responsibility on us to ensure that we come up, we work hard. Samasai, which have been posed by Corona, they are only an indication. They are only a sanket hai. Iske liye hume disha nirdesh mila hai. Hume disha nirdesh ko manna hai. Hume aage badna hai. Hume ye dekhna hai. Hamari samasya pehli hai ki hume survive karna hai as individuals. 45 crore labor. Other people, 80 crore people who have been affected indirectly or directly, small business and businessmen, etc. I think we need to really ensure that there is a Dishandradesh. We have to work for Dharma, we have to work for earth, we have to work for Kama, and we at the same time ensure that we are happy human beings. Because happiness is an important thing. Now, in this case, Jivan ka actually earth, Jivan ke earth ko earth dena hai. Hum kaise earth denge isko? हम अर्थ दे सकते हैं जब अर्थ के लिए काम करेंगे और इसी तरीके से जो परिस्थितियां किसी भी प्रकार की हो भारत में भारतीयों ने परिस्थितियों के परिस्थितियों के अनुसार आगे बढ़ना सीखा है जहां जहां चैलेंजेस आए वहां वहां उनको अपॉर्चुनिटीज में क्रिएट करके प्रॉब्लम को सॉर्ट आउट किया है और हम लोग सभी देखते रहे हैं कि हमारी परिस्थितियां समय समय पर बढ़ी हमारे से उल्टी रही है लेकिन हम उसे चिंता नहीं किया है इसलिए मैं ये समझता हूं वट दिलाई लामा सेट इज द पर्पज ऑफ अवर लाइफ इज टू बी हैप्पी वेदर वी हैव स्मॉल फंड स्मॉल रिसोर्सिस 
whether we need to work hard or whether our conditions are against us we need to really be happy we need to work hard we need to ensure and we need to contribute our own main job should be to survive first then to concentrate on growth both at the individual level as well as at the gross level corona next say we follow rules but help with corona we will work and we will work hard as hard as possible to ensure that the economy survive we as individual survive and we are happy at the end of the day we need to ship up and we will not ship out i think if we resolve that we ship up and we will not ship out corona cannot do that we know it for certain sun is always brighter after very after the very dark night if it is so at the end of the tunnel there is light and that light we are looking for corona is one aspect it has affected look at the government's actions only about 5000 people died i think it is a success of the government look at the way the people died as in the european european countries and america we did not have those facilities we have created health facilities the government is likely to focus on health which has not been given that kind of attention or priority in the past government has to give priority on education because it is educated people who will follow guideline more seriously than others now in such circumstances i i say one who fears suffers a fear psychosis has been created because of the world situation of the corona no we don't need to fear but we need to be careful and we don't want to suffer we want to be happy we will work hard work harder we need to learn with corona a ah, lack crores of people in this country live by the in in very poor conditions working conditions very poor living conditions but they survive there is a lot of bacteria around but they survive we are different from european world we are different from developed world we live on our past incomes we don't live on our future incomes i think indians are a different brand they are hard working they are intelligent they can adjust to even any given situation and i am sure corona will not be do able to do much damage to us both the government is active in supporting it we are happy we can do it ourselves and i am sure the country will grow and sustain itself because of the corona pandemics now what we need is that we need to be careful follow guidelines work hard and maintain ourselves very well but one thing we should not be there in our dictionary is the fear of corona take it as a challenge take it as an opportunity and i think that is the best way to live with corona if we are to live as who says because corona is going to live for quite some time then let corona live side by side and we will live happily working hard contributing to the country following guidelines and be happy thank you very much for giving me an opportunity aman it's really a pleasure speaking to the people thank you very much aman thank you uh, thank you professor agarwal and now i go to professor deepak to have a uh, you want to make a point or say something please go ahead yes thank you professor professor jd thank you very much uh, aman i have to take a call from one of my principals in africa so i have just said i'll call back i'll be leaving but there's one question for the remaining speakers i'd like to pose to you and perhaps you could give me an answer in the past when we've had a global crisis and corona certainly is a global crisis we've sought global solutions we've looked for leadership today who is providing the leadership the united states ah, ah, ah. western europe they have no idea what's hit them have you heard of a racket called the united nations 20 years ago they used to be active now they've fallen flat china oh thank you very much so where is the global leadership going to come from please address this issue who is going to provide the leadership to deal with corona otherwise globalization will be buried in the um, graveyard somewhere near new delhi and every year we'll go and put a wreath on it 
please let me know who can provide the global leadership. Sir, I have to take this call from the Prime Minister. So I'm just uh, from Africa. So thank you very much, Professor Agarwal. Always a pleasure. Yamini, sorry, I can't listen to you. And Saurabh, you are the brightest kids that India has. So thank you very much, Aman, once again. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I would request Saurabh to kindly contain in five minutes and the Army will Just a second, Saurabh, if you can switch on your mic and uh, then we can uh, go forward, please. Uh, can you put your mic on, Saurabh? Saurabh? My mic is on. I, I'm, yeah, please am I audible? Yeah. Yes, you are. So a uh, very uh, good evening and uh, thank you Professor Aman for giving me this opportunity. Now um, um, I, I heard and um, but if we start from today, today we had a very good meeting between our Indian Prime Minister Modi ji and the Prime Minister of Australia and he made a very big point uh, in the very small interaction that was done and they said that whatever trade India should have with Australia, it is far below that level. That means we must improve our trade. So when I talk about business during Corona period, I think this is a time when Indian businesses have to come forward and take up businesses, um, uh, number of uh, businesses um, uh, with international uh, 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 countries like Australia, entire Asia Pacific region, Europe. Now, when I talk about business, we, we are having trade deficit. And if we are having trade deficit, we must increase our exports and at the same time reduce our imports. I don't know if you've seen today itself, uh, it's summer and a lot of people are using uh, imported air conditioners and, and it's estimated about $1.2 billion worth of air conditioners are imported by India. I think in last one year, if you have done so much harm, I think we can undo it by buying local brand ACs uh, we could do it for PPE kit. We have done it by producing almost 3 lakh uh, kits per day. We can produce local air conditioners and I, I would recommend uh, um, all people who are listening to this, this and who want to listen, thousands of people who want to listen it on YouTube that it is it's a task and the government is doing its task of increasing the customs duty, uh, which is very important. At the same time, I, I would like to talk about uh, you know, somewhat about stock markets. Stock markets, you know, we did an event study um, uh, and, and in an event study on hotel stocks. Uh, what we found was the minute it was declared as a pandemic on 11th March, uh, the stock prices uh, really fell down and uh, the index fell down almost by 20 22%, while stock, hotel stocks went down by almost 30 to 45%. Now, if you see, and this reduced as we increased the event study from 10 days to 20 days to 30 days, uh, that it, uh, the, the decline was. And now when the economy locked down, uh, the opening one has started, would you believe companies like Shellet, uh, please, uh, they are not for investment, but just for an idea, they are giving almost yesterday, they was giving 13 to 14% return per stock. And there are some companies like Lemon Tree, there are orders worth 20 lakh you know, available, but there are no sellers. So people expect huge. So, so the U-turn has already started or what we say the V-shape has already started. The economy is opening up and, and, and I see uh, not only this, I, I can see certain sectors, specifically pharmaceutical sector. Um, uh, we could, we could see fertilizer sector, uh, particularly Deepak nitrides and, and um, uh, you know, these sectors really bouncing back. The, the whole uh, way uh, the stock markets are banking sector yesterday, uh, there were stocks giving almost 14 to 15 percent return. Now, this shows the positive sentiment with which the economy is uh, bouncing back. Um, the, we have to have a clear cut, clear cut plan. And, and if we see uh, for opening up, our government did the right thing to close at the right time and it's doing the right way, we should open up. Uh, however, we have to understand that there are certain sectors like hotels, construction, manufacturing, maintenance, they would need opening up. And job is the, one of the most vulnerable place where people are likely to get Corona. 
So this 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 tends to really bring a problem. Another issue, which 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 before I end, uh, maybe a minute more, is is the issue of uh, funding. So a lot of Indian corporates, uh, be it SME, MSMEs or big corporates, they're facing a lot of funding issues. So big corporates are going in for rights issues like Reliance. Other big corporates are also planning their own rights issue. Apart from this, uh, even government is being creative. Non-profit organizations, they are going to be permitted to raise money uh, by getting listed. So this is, this is a very unique change which I've seen. It's, it has just happened. Also, unique methods are coming up for lending. For example, WhatsApp has already applied to NPCI that they can go in for lending. Big companies which have big assets, they are creating mutual fund trusts and those trusts are being used to uh, gather money from uh, people who are doing systematic investment plan. Uh, top up loans have come up whereby companies can take these loans uh, under collateral fee and the government of India is going to guarantee these loans. Uh, so this is, this is, I think, very uh, unique development that has happened during uh, um, uh, post uh, uh, Corona that the government of India has come said, we are going to guarantee you take the loan and it's going to be a collateral free loan. And this is, the amount is also very big, 3 lakh crores. Of course, on grounds, thing will take time. Uh, however, the policy is there. Reserve Bank of India has reduced the reverse repo rate. Uh, which, which is of course again very um, uh, uh, desirable, but it needs to be further reduced so that private banks do not pass apart almost four lakh crores with the Reserve Bank of India. They need to give it as loans. Uh, also, microfinance institutions have come up with a new idea of pseudo equity, whereby they are saying that we're going to convert our debt into equity, but the proposal is pending with Ministry of Finance. Apart from this, a lot of work is going on in receivable financing. That means any company has a lot of receivables, how, how um, uh, you know, it can be done. Uh, they can get money out of those. Apart from this, if, if I see, you know, even during this Corona period, had anyone invested in this one stock called IPCA, his wealth would have doubled by now. What does it mean? Markets have already started picking up. What are the good sectors that are coming up? Banking, sugar stocks, hotel stocks, which have taken a big beating. Wires and cables business. You know, they are, they, all these, you know, pharma sector. What I'm saying is that these are the sectors where the new post-COVID area uh, entrepreneurs, startups need to focus. And these are the areas uh, which, are, which have really developed, be it sanitizers, PPE kits, Today itself, I saw a company has come up with a way whereby hospitals can segregate COVID waste vis a vis non COVID waste. So I think uh, this, this is something which is required. However, still a lot of funding issues remain. MSME exchange or SME exchange needs to be uh, really uh, boosted and, and people can raise money, companies can raise money. Also, at the same time, there are many prescriptions for entrepreneurs and individuals. Reduce your capacity. Any excess capacity you have, you must try to reduce it. Monetize your assets in the sense that if you've already put in a lot of money into shares and mutual funds, it's the tight time to put them into pledge and to raise money rather than taking debts. Also, it's time to make your employees your own owners of your companies in the sense that if uh, you know, you're really not able to pay the salaries, then it's the right time that ESOPs miss should be offered, employee stock option plans. I think this way, your company will become more inclusive. And at the same time, your salary component will reduce. Uh, a big news came that the exports dip has happened. And we are going to face a lot of big trouble because merchandise exports have fallen by almost 60%. Uh, uh, just in, you know, March, April and May. Uh, and, and this has really shocked, you know, the, uh, our, our uh, balance of payment scenario. In such a case, our companies, exporters need to focus inwards. Atma Nirbhar, that means we need to produce for local markets. And I can see many of my export friends have gone into pay creation of PPE kits, of masks. I think this is very important. However, a lot has been done and a lot needs to be done. 
the GST rates needs to be reduced. The compliance work has to be reduced. The reverse repo rate needs to be reduced. Many laws need to be changed, specifically in real estate sector, in the sense that currently our real estate players cannot sell a property below the circle rate. Now, if they want liquidity on their asset, why the government stopping them to sell below the circle rate? So that should be allowed. At the same time, individuals are getting better off. Customers are getting better off after getting it at below the circle rate. I think laws need to be changed. Lastly, I'm going to talk about health. Uh, I am on the board of Employee State Insurance Corporation and the corporation has done a fantastic job of providing a lot of hospitals, a lot of beds, a lot of ventilators. Uh, this is a rich organization with a corpus of more than 90,000 crores. However, I feel a lot more could have been done. I have myself written to the Honorable Minister. One is unemployment insurance. That means whoever MSMEs we are covering, we should provide the salaries for them, especially those who are getting salaries less than 21,000 crores, uh, 21,000 rupees. I've also recommended that since we are having a big corpus, of 90,000 crores, uh, we must donate to various uh, PM and CM relief funds, specifically because disaster is coming. Uh, however, our corporation has already done a lot in the sense that almost till I joined, this corporation was investing only in fixed deposits. I became a member of uh, the investment committee and I recommended them. It's time to change. And they changed. Unlike a typical bureaucratic organization, they are investing now, they're giving money by investing in government securities. They are investing in state governments by taking their state, by subscribing to state development loans. Benefit to the government, they are getting the money. Benefit to the corporation, where they would get 5.75% on FD, they are getting almost 7.5%. So almost 200 basis point more they are going to earn. Um, at the same time, uh, I think small savers uh, need to be protected. I, I was, uh, you know, a little bit on the on the fr uh, front that RBI bonds have been discontinued and what retail investors would have got 7.75%. They no longer can do that. And I think um, uh, once the Corona period gets over, maybe two years or whatever, uh, the government may plan to bring it back. Um, so, Darona, Corona, Kusto Corona. Or webinar karo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Saurav, uh, uh, for that last comment. And as we said, the life would sustain and life would be there with Corona. I'll go to Yamini to give a brief summary and then put her points in between. And then after that, we'll go to question answers. We'll take two, three questions given the time frame, and then we will move to end the session for today. Uh, Yamini, uh, over to you. If you can unmute yourself, please. Uh, I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Um, a very good evening to everyone and um, it's a pleasure to be at this valuable August gathering which has brought forth uh, extremely important learnings from the Corona and where it brings about the perspective of Corona not from the point of view of fear but from the challenges that we accept for ourselves and the learnings that each individual introduced in their sessions while speaking to us. And well, I have been given an extremely difficult task to summarize uh, the most valuable insights that we received from most of the speakers. I'll move on the chronological order in the way they, uh, they spoke. And I have tried to um, understand and pick up the best of the insights for the audience today. So I'll begin with um, what Dr. Surinder Kathpalya said, which uh, he did uh, bring about an overview of how the world has been affected by the coronavirus with different uh, people who have been affected and the kind of deaths that have been seen from where it started, how did it start and what happened how the lockdown has been having a devastating effect on business, supply chains, and has created irrational behaviors and so forth. There have been certain companies which have been taking a benefit out of it, um, which is like Amazon, Netflix, uh, Prime uh, Time, uh, Prime Video, and the others. 
He also said that uh, by far the coronavirus has affected least in India as there have been much lower deaths that have been there. Uh, however, the virus does, uh, you know, he, he, he like, like an analytics person said, okay, there are three possibilities that are there. One, if the virus exists, if the vaccine exists, and what uh, if the uh, virus suddenly, dis uh, if, the, uh, if the virus continues to be there. So he said if the virus disappears, there would be resumption of the work which is there in the same manner as it was there. And if the vaccine is developed, then uh, the similar business trends and social trends would also immediately emerge. He did say that the government has an important role to play in providing guidelines as to how the work should be there. There has been resumption in terms of trust in certain economies like China and Singapore for travels and all. And there has been also a certain amount of uh, attributable change in terms of a people's ability to work um, in what they were wanting to do. So people are moving to work from where they are. Uh, from their houses and they, they would look for better locations where there are healthcare services and food supply. He also said that, um, you know, one should encourage investments in new projects, uh, get educated and be skilled for new jobs. Uh, roti, kapra and makan continue to remain as the most important factors and there should be a greater focus on healthcare, food security and education. And the very important aspect which all speakers have said including Dr. Katapalia is that there is resilience in the mankind to overcome any disasters, including Corona. Uh, Professor Vora well, uh, did uh, say that, you know, when we talk about coronavirus, we have different learnings and we have different learnings from a personal aspect, from a professional aspect and from other aspects. He began with the most positive aspect of saying that we are a younger world which has different, in different countries, which have younger population. And the demographics is itself young to be able to have hope and life in it. Uh, again, India, he said that India is one carrying out the largest change in bringing about large peace, uh, peace out evacuations worldwide, which is one of the uh, strengths of the country today in the toughest times which it faces for the coronavirus. He said among his lear uh, personal learnings, he has been able to be learning to be self-reliant. Some of the household jobs which he never did, he's trying to do them, he's trying to work on his own. He, ha he has learned to have more pride, which was already there. It, it, has, it, has, got more, it has got a boost with the way the country has handled the coronavirus. His admiration for the Chinese have gone down. His professional learnings continue to remain uh, the fact that people continue to put profit above people. Uh, there is much more greater respect for uh, professionals like the scientists, medical professionals, and the others. He said that there is also something called social learnings from this coronavirus, which we are going to live with, which is that we are going to move to contactless greetings, we are going to travel when it's essential. Um, he also learned that social media has the power to manipulate the manner in which news and information reaches us. An important aspect which he said was, uh, one has in this particular time of coronavirus learned to spend time with their family. From the running lives that we have, we are wanting to spend time with our family. What he said that, you know, with his positive outcomes, he has pledged not to buy any, he and his wife has pledged not to buy any Chinese products, would like to sponsor girl child, which brings about self-fulfillment. He also understands that the Chinese power hurts and it has affected the world badly. And India has given the example of healing, which is an important example. Again, he said that no virus dies, whichever virus would have been. One has to learn to live with it. Well, uh, then we had an in, uh, uh, we had a business uh, we had a speaker from the industry, Dr. Pocher, who also emphasized on being self-reliant. Also said that this coronavirus has especially brought many families together at this time. And what is more important for more people today is to take care of their health, to increase their immunity. 
to begin with oneself rather than anybody else. And she went out to the roots of the country, to the Sanskritic uh, systems of the country, right from the Ayurveda to the yoga, to using the basil leaf, to using the eucalyptus oil, to coconut oil as a means of improving it. She said businesses are changing platforms, which includes e-commerce today. And she said the government's initiative of Swachh Bharat has come really into picture with this coronavirus. She said there is resumption of life, the factories opening up and the developments that are there. Again, she says it is going to take time. It is going to be a slow and a gradual process. There is continuous government support and this continuity would help. She also said that she believes in the health system that the country has. And it is one of the best systems that are there. And the workers in the healthcare system are doing a great job. So which, which does bring in the positivity of the fact that the coronavirus probably cannot hurt us. Then we had Professor, we had uh, Mr. Muhammad Ayin Khan, who also gave a very important aspect in looking at the life with Corona in the short term, medium term, and the long term. Where he said that there are demand shocks, supply shocks, and liquidity shocks, which need to be taken into consideration while one is estimating the effect of the coronavirus. He said the demand shock is likely to be there primarily because of the, uh, of the distortions that have happened in the labor markets. He also talked about different curves which are going to be formed in terms of affecting our way of doing businesses. He said there are certain sectors which are likely to see additional capacity buildups in terms of infrastructure, especially the education that is there. And he said what is more important over here is that the economy learns to uh, dwell in the different perspectives of the short, medium, and the long term that are there. Then we had uh, the speaker from Sweden, Osa, who actually uh, gave a very different perspective and a different philosophy to what the world has been working on in terms of the lockdown. Where Sweden, we understand, is a country which did not really believe in introducing lockdowns, but did believe in letting people be socially responsible for themselves. She said she believes that she, her, her daughter and uh, her husband have been affected by Corona and they've been taking care of their medication themselves and they've not really gone for a test because in, in Sweden, there is a philosophy that if you're hospitalized, then you should go in for a testing facility that is there. She also gave a perspective in terms of how Corona uh, is seen in terms of a virus which needs to gain immunity and um, one needs to get one needs to work towards uh, taking it as a part of life and not stopping life. Uh, she also gave a perspective on Africa, which she said there has been a low penetration in Africa because there's a low international exposure there, and the lockdown over there has helped in um, not having affected lives in Africa. Then we had Dr. Pandav. Dr. Chandrakant Pandav, who actually uh, called Corona his guru. Again, what is most important is that everybody has learned from coronavirus. They have taken it uh, in the spirit of bringing about new learnings. The strongest message that he believed that Corona was giving was that the world is a family. And he said there is enough for everyone's need and not uh, enough for everyone's greed. And hence, there is sufficient in the world markets to treat everyone well. Uh, choices are important. Most important resource in hand is time. And no one knows how much time is one is left with. Given this coronavirus, nobody really knows what is going to happen next. And the coronavirus has been a guru in teaching him personal uh, things. He had earned several degrees, but the coronavirus has taught him to be self-reliant in doing household works, other works which he had never thought of being doing. He also said pain and suffering are a part of life. And the most important degree that he's earned through this coronavirus is being calm. He, he also said that to be passionate is what one needs to be at all times. And one needs to be passionate about animals also. Important equa uh, equation which he gave was E is equal to F. He said education is the future, and which is true. 
from this seminar, or from the valuable insights, or from the valuable work that many of the educationists have been doing in uh, teaching people. They've been giving livelihoods to people and have been leading the world to a better place. Then we had Dr. Mahesh Singh, who actually talked about and spoke about how his university has been continuously contributing into the healthcare system and has been guiding force in the coronavirus and how the different contributions of his colleagues and everyone by working together in their own spheres has been helping the um, uh, helping people to really recognize that the work continues to be there even in this in the uh, phases of coronavirus then we had professor jd agarwal who actually uh, gave a very strong message in, say, in the sense saying that coronavirus has created disruptions in the economy and um, the world recognizes that the coronavirus is likely to create a contraction in the world economies and the contractions have been recognized by uh, institutions like the RBI and the government and necessary steps have been taken by the government. He is happy with the way the large economic stimulus that has been given of 20 lakh crores to uh, protect India as well as to overcome the crisis. He also said economies will go through uh, an entire transformation phase and this changes would happen in terms of international trade, in terms of international relations, in terms of the capital flows, uh, in terms of the global outlook that is likely to be there. Um, what has been the positive aspect of the economy has been that there was an entire lockdown everywhere, but there was no lockdown in the agriculture sector, which could sell anywhere at any time. And today has the possibility of selling through the uh, e-commerce medium. He also said you have the macroeconomic perspective, which has been being taken care of by the governments and by the institutions like the RBI. But at the micro level, there are people who need to learn uh, to do their work they, they need to not ask the nation what the nation can do for themselves, but they need to ask what they can do for the nation. What the government should, could not, could, could, can, should not do for them, but they should do for the country together. He also said that the economy is there for a renovation, and this renovation needs a certain set of guidelines which will come forth from the government. And one strongest message which he actually said that we've survived the toughest of the uh, situations in the markets. Indians are hardworking people, committed people, uh, educated people, and they have come through with the toughest, in the most difficult times, and they would come through from this virus also. And for a mankind, one need not fear from the coronavirus, but one needs to live with the challenging times, come through it, and work for themselves and for the nation. Then we had uh, Dr. Kiran Devi. Who, uh, uh, who actually brought about extremely important insights into saying that we cannot take things for granted. What we do have recognized fact is that since the world existed, there have been regional uh, tragic incidences, disasters that have affected us, whether it's in the form of pandemics or in the form of Janiawala Bagh or any other factors, they've been affecting us. And there, uh, this coronavirus also teaches us that there have been positives and negatives that have been there. The positives have been some, some industries have been doing extremely well uh, where you have pharmaceutical sector, you have um, the other sectors which have been doing well and there are certain sectors which have been very badly affected by coronavirus, which is travel, tourism, entertainment and have been there. She said, there needs to be a five piece plan which is plan perspective projects and preparations and there needs to be a stronger focus for the people need to move from what we call as b work to something called e work that is there uh for the she concentrated on businesses health and the government so on the health side she said uh we need to learn from kerala uh, uh, the primary health systems are strong there needs to be more participation from the uh, uh, panchayats as well as local authorities in building the healthcare system, evaluating them and so forth. On the part of the government, there needs to be a more human approach. Uh, from the human approach, there needs to be an approach to nature care and there needs to be a recreation of villages into smart villages. There needs to be rethinking of urbanization that is there. 
Dharavis need to be not repeated around the world. As for people, they, she felt that you know people are not really understanding the grave consequences of not taking precautions, which she felt felt that was a continued problem in Puducherry as well as in many other parts where prosecution is taking place for not wearing masks. And uh, media can play a crucial role in educating people, which it has been doing, and, and it will continue to do so. Uh, she also said the internal warriors like doctors, police, SWACH, uh, Swachta, Abhyan people, and the disaster management team is doing a great job, and they will continue to be the warriors of tomorrow. Uh, she also said that the trust needs to be reposed in the, uh, uh, in the people and the government, and instead of criticizing any action, it is necessary suggestions may be done, and they may support the government. Lastly, we had Saurav, uh, who was an important speaker, who said um, that uh, there are innovative means which are being brought about. There is resumption in the overall activity of the economy, and the coronavirus has affected people in rebuilding innovative solutions for themselves, for finding funding and finding and developing newer models of creating avenues for themselves to fund. He said people are looking for funding. The government is doing a great job in terms of bringing about the three lakh crore package to the MSMEs. There are unique methods. There are uh, companies which are bringing about rights issues. There are uh, microfinance institutions which are going from debt to equity. There is work that is going on in receivable financing. Markets are picked up. There is no need for SME exchange. Uh, there is a need for uh, rationalization of the GST and uh, reduced compliances, a greater effort that needs to be done. And obviously, one needs to not be fearful of the corona and one needs to be more proactive about the coronavirus. So overall, an extremely relevant and a very valuable session of the extremely uh, important insights that we can learn to live with this um, coronavirus. As we say, life goes on and the show must go on whether you have something or whether you don't have something with the coronavirus. I have not felt by speaking to any Indian or anybody, uh, especially an Indian, ever feeling that the coronavirus will stop his life. Even being in a lockdown for two months, everyone has the feel and the desire to do stronger and much more. They've been trying to utilize their time to the best, spending their time with their families, and which does hold the key of the coronavirus affecting our lives and likely to go forward in a more positive, constructive, and a better manner. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yamini, uh, for that insight of briefing of everybody and your small anecdotes. I would now open the house for just one or two questions. If there are any, just raise your hands and then maybe we can take those questions. Otherwise, we will end this session because we're already an hour up our time. Uh, uh, anyone who wants to ask a question may kindly just raise his hand or open his video so that we can take the questions. We do have most of our speakers here with us still. Uh, they would be happy to answer one or two questions, but not more. I don't think, I think it's, it's been, ex there is one, Dr. Raki Gupta. Finally, I get to see someone raise their hands. Very well. Uh, Dr. Raki Gupta, please go ahead. Uh, you can ask your question, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Raki, and I'm uh, hi. Uh, I'm uh, from a, I'm an assistant professor in the Faculty of Commerce, Banaras Hindu University, BHU Varanasi. But since I'm from academics, you know, a lot of people are getting in touch with me and they're asking, I myself uh, uh, speak and I'm an alumnus from IIM Ahmedabad. I completed my FDPM program from IIM Ahmedabad. My core question is, I heard so many speakers, however, I joined a little late and I'm thankful to the admin who let me in the session. My question is, um, where do we see the education industry as of now? We know a lot of online uh, studies, online videos, everything they are going on. However, there is still a need 
to improve or uh, no, where do where do we see education at this point of time a lot of students they are people are, i i one of the messages i read that one of the student um, uh, somewhere in up or somewhere he uh, she committed suicide because she was unable to attend the online classes and nobody in her house had any of uh, the android phones so where is the education industry heading to i heard the speakers they were talking about all of uh, government regulations um, i heard uh, you know the borrow also posing question here yeah, sir was asking you know who's going to take up the leadership so definitely that's a million dollar question but my most point is what about education what about the sure. career objects uh, what are what about the career opportunities for the younger generations how do you see uh, this aspect sir i can't hear yeah so, uh, we will now respond we we'll go to deepak gore and then uh, suri because suri is uh, in Thank you, uh, ma'am. Thank you for your question. Sorry that this kid committed suicide. We have a hundred million smartphones in the country, so she is obviously uh, belongs to a family that did not have a. Uh, I beg your pardon. We have a thousand million. We have a billion smartphones in the country. Obviously, she came from one of the families that didn't have it. When you have three hundred forty million students in your country. 51% are girls unfortunate incidents which should not occur will occur where is education headed ma'am abuse and curse and shout all you want your an education is yourself for me the numbers are important the hunger the thirst for education that is what we are focusing on so education will not go away it's one of the most important factors that determine a nation's development and if we have been able to deal with the corona virus as well as we have it's because people read the messages that come out on their smartphones or listen to television or to radio or read the newspapers they understand what's going on i shudder to think of what would have happened today we are at 88% literacy had we been at 25% or 12% as we were at independence how would you get your message across do you understand ma'am so education will remain a top priority right don't worry about it. and by the way uh, dr aman i had to leave this conversation for briefly to attend to a call from one of my african principals um amazing 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 they are following this racket called the weird health or sorry the world health organization and this uh, person has asked me if i can speak to whoever i have to they want half a million tablets of hydrochloro chloroquine for their country they had stopped it because of what the, the weird health organization did and now they want it resumed so i was very pleased that they are following latest developments and the leadership of india in this area thank you we'll go to uh, suri and then to professor jd agarwal for their responses well please suri well education is a priority and i think one of the things coming out from this crisis as i said was that uh, pe uh, people who were young and the youth have been relatively unaffected uh where somebody has been affected they have been able to come out of it just like uh people in sweden have survived uh, you know the corona virus so kids must go back to school universities must open that's one perspective the other perspective uh i live in singapore and we we have a developed system here and parents in the schools are very nervous about sending their children to school so the government wants the kids to go to school but the parents are nervous about sending the kids to school because they're worried the kids may come back home infected so that's the the challenge the way i look at it in certainly in developed countries what you're going to see is more of a hybrid learning where you're going to have some classroom and some home based learning or internet learning that probably is the way to go regardless of whether we have a cure for corona or not thank you thank you uh, suri uh, we'll go to professor jd agarwal now professor agarwal if you may want to say a comment your response to that question well very important question has been raised very important question let's look at it from one or two points of view first issue which you have raised is online online education 
that is only to be a supporting methodology and not the main methodology in a country like India. Deepak is right that it can be done even on smartphones or on mobiles. But the people, there's already too much of a wide gap in terms of the quality of education being imparted in this country. Public schools, so-called public schools, which are private schools. Amongst them, different qualities, A, B, C, D. Then we have government-aided schools. Again, among government-aided schools, there are many qualities than government schools. There, even among government schools and central schools, there are different qualities of A, B, C, D. Ministry of HRD is also trying to identify which one is what. Now, the point is, there are schools which do not wear the, either the teachers or the schools do not have even appropriate facility to teach even the minimum, that is A, or E, e or A, B, C, D, or even 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10. Now, this wide gap which is created among one category of students, another category of students is dangerous for this country at the school level. The same classification is being done at the highest education level. The same colleges, the same universities, and so on and so forth. 600 universities, if you classify them, you will find probably only about 30 to 40 universities which are imparting quality education. Although all of them having graduation, all of them are having PhD, all of them are having MPhil, and they are the same people who are even teaching. Now that's apart from that. Education, unfortunately, Macaulay has spoiled this country. And we need to revert back to what it was. It, is, it has only become a source of earning in this country. Everywhere, including IIMs, IITs, institutions of national importance, they only talk about what placement, how much money are you going to get, what are you going to do there. Nobody talks about whether you're going to produce a great citizen, an important person in the country, making social and contribution to the nation. Are you going to be spiritual? Are you going to be somebody contributing to the country, to your own family, to your own village, and so on and so forth? No, nothing doing. We set up institutes of agriculture, apex bodies. Those who come for BSc in agriculture never go back to the farms to teach. They stay back in cities and towns. The same is the situation everywhere. What placement am I going to get? Five, two lakh, three lakh, five lakh, ten lakh, fifteen lakh, twenty lakh, and some schools and colleges at the higher level, they talk about my student got fifty lakh, sixty lakh, SRCC where I taught. Uh, they claim sixty lakh for a student who just passed out BCom. Well, maybe that was a solo case that raises issues in the minds of the people, and it creates frustration in the minds of. 99% people. Once I remember after I left IIT Delhi, I had to go with a foreign visitor to meet the director, was not available. We sought necessary permission. We met, I met the deputy director. I will not name at the year. He said during our conversation that we reject 99.5% people who appear for the IIT exam, admission. Ah, I remember when I taught, maybe I had a similar perspective. Then I was so sad to listen to my deputy director. Of course, I was not in IIT at that time. You reject 99.5% people. You ad admit only 0.5%. What the hell have you been doing? Have you been set up only for this purpose? I did not speak that to him. I always had serious objections to Sri Ram College of Commerce in Delhi University. I was visited in Delhi University, visitor's nominee, I was visitor's nominee in Pandeshiri, and I, my full focus was not only create quality, create quantity. India needs both quantity and quality. In the name of so-called useless quality we talk about, in terms of placement, I think we only say 
that we are destroying and creating sections of society in the country. I feel education is going to survive. Regular education, both at the school and the college level, has to survive. Let us see what the new education policy with the human, uh, honorable, honest, uh, uh, human resource ministry is talking about and the government is talking about for the last one year, whether, what, what it does, what it, does it have in its scope? But I am sure teachers need to be passionate about teaching. As Deepak said, we need to have an urge, we need to have a passion. I remember we were few, Deepak and myself, we were studied in Delhi school. We were passionate in education. And I think that makes a lot of difference. We found many of our people got into IS, IPS. Many of people working in international organizations. Many of us are professors in, in United States and America. We did great research. Some of, many of us have great, done great research. I think that was because the people who joined Delhi School of Economics were passionate. Those who joined Shriram College of Commerce were passionate. Those who joined IIT where I taught were passionate. I think that passion has to emerge among students. We are not to, we are not to, you know, feed them. Spoon feeding is not necessary. To awaken them, to create a mind which is analytical in, in nature, which can find solutions at instant, the moment a question or a problem is raised. Not cramming, not placement, not jobs not money which one is going to get. And that is the whole focus which has emerged. Some of the top universities in the country, some of the business, some of the schools, educational institutions, they have only tried to train students in such a way that they emerge at great regions of the country. And also they have developed great brains. Well, I think both the regular education, teaching, as well as online teaching, will continue to be together. That will create another distinction. But I must say at the end, it must be learning teaching rather than teaching learning, which has to be adopted as a methodology in educational institutions in this country. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. That was, the question was very well answered. Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope that answers the part of your question. I'll go to Ankita Pandey as the last question for today to be asked. Uh, Dr. Ankita Pandey, please introduce yourself and then ask your question, please. Uh, Mahesh, if you have yes, something sir. to say, please do uh, raise your hand so that I can open your eyes as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Ankita ji, just a second. Let yeah. me have Mahesh and then I will go come to you. Just a second, please. Yes, Mahesh, please go ahead. Can you unmute yourself? Thank you Mahesh? very much. Yeah, thank, you. Uh, I just, I just, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to add... Uh, one example, what we did at our university. Yeah, it, uh, during the lockdown and also the university was closed, but uh, we had lots of complaint about uh, mental illness. The students were suffering with uh, you know, distress and everything. So I gave uh, a good idea to our management team and uh, we established uh, 20 psychologists and psychiatrists in the group and we had a a hotline number, so students were continuously in touch with the psychologist, psychiatrist, and uh, yeah, we provided uh, this kind of help, and it was very, very successful. Every day, at least 20 to 30 students, even the teachers as well, they were calling, and we kept the, we never asked the name, so we kept the identity, uh, because of our university policies, but uh, we got lots of complaints and, uh, 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 and we solved them, we helped them uh, mentally. Uh, this is, I think, this is a very, very good initiation. All universities, all the colleges need to implement to have uh, some hotline number for the students and also for the teacher because it's very, very important for in this period of time in the pandemic. Uh, you need to also think about the students' uh, mental health. Also for the teachers, they are also suffering because they are missing their student, and students missing uh, their colleagues and also their friends. And uh, in, this, in this, I think uh, my suggestion is to implement the mental health team, psychologist in your uh, institution 
in every institution. I think that that will help a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mahesh. Uh, can we now have uh, Dr. Ankita Pandey, if you can introduce yourself and then uh, ask a question, please. Namaskar. Uh, namaskar. Uh, good evening to all the dignitaries. Myself, Dr. Ankita Pandey. And uh, I am uh, uh, a professor uh, at Sri uh, Gurnanagar's degree college, uh, affiliated to Lucknow University. It is really great to listen to all uh, the speakers and my it's my uh, heartfelt gratitude to you all. My question here is, sir, uh, I belong to the field of education and uh, the, a recent question that was asked uh, that a uh, girl, uh, there's a student who committed suicide. So I want to just tell that we have students uh, there was a student, she was from a very off background. She used to, she has started stitching masks, earning money and recharging her phone to take the class. It is only perception that matters. My question here is, we are talking about Atmanirbhar, self-reliant India. It will, it is definitely going to happen. It will, it is going to happen. I know that it will happen. But uh, the question here is like, uh, I have a small business and I had a order of around uh, two lakh masks to be delivered. Uh, two lakh hand gloves to be delivered. I searched and actually searched deeply, but there was no supplier. Nobody was ready to supply uh, uh, the, ma the gloves. They were saying that we don't have the raw material. They were saying that we, uh, we don't have anything to, you know, uh, just to make the gloves. We're talking about pharmaceutical uh, sector to bounce back. It is definitely going to bounce back. But the raw material is coming from China. We are talking about education sector. All the apps that we are using are not Indian. I had attended many webinars, sir. And my one question that goes is, uh, we are talking about e-content. Are there any apps that are uh, Indian? But I never got any answer. I know it will happen. I know that things will take time. But my question is when it is going to happen and when we are going to shine bright. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, who would like to take the call of answering? Yeah. Deepak Goraji then. We go. Thank you very much for your question, ma'am. It's uh, very... Can you hear me, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, sir. I'm, I can hear you. Thank you very much for your question. It's very appropriate. It's an apposite question. You said shortage of raw material. Do you know why there's a shortage of raw material? because we were entirely dependent on the Chinese. The supply chains all led to and originated from China. We'd all become so totally reliant on one country and that country is the world's biggest cheat. So we'd become, we had become so totally dependent that we didn't have our own supply chains. That is now changing. Second question you'd ask was, um, you had mentioned something about when will we become Atanirbha? The coronavirus is a glorious opportunity to understand the virtues of being self -reliant. And as far as the raw material for your gloves is concerned, it's just not available because the Chinese factories had shut down. It was not available. It wasn't coming to us. Now we're going to make the raw material ourselves. You know, they've talked about personal protective equipment. Professor Raman, Professor Agarwal, JD sir, my colleague and friend, you know about this. That at the time the virus broke, there was not one Indian company making personal protective equipment. Now we are making almost half a million uh, pieces of PPE per day. Where did this come from? It's the entrepreneurial spirit of India that is in the forefront. So ma'am, have faith. Um, understand that we are starting from a very low base, but we'll move very fast. The only thing that I'll say in this is uh, the Mahatma, the great leader of the world, was once asked, Bapu, how do I change the world? His answer was, begin with yourself. It's very, very simple. Right? Uh, we'll go to... Uh, Suri, would you like to take a call on it? Before I go to Professor Agarwal? No, I have nothing nothing further to add. Uh, yeah. But I, I you know, well-being of students and well-being of, of teachers uh, is at uh, top of mind for everybody in education because that is key. You have to provide a, a secure environment uh, and a safe environment and a happy environment for everyone. Perfect. We'll go to Professor J.D. Agarwal now. He had raised his hand. Uh, Professor Agarwal. Yes, uh, one day we have had some questions as I, I know, I, 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 
very well replied, responded to your question. Just to add a few things, I would say, go back to 1947. All this 150 years when British ruled in this country, the British industry was fed with India's raw material. Economic situation says the only country where industrial development took place in the world, in the whole history of the global economy in Britain was without having its own agriculture, without promoting agriculture. That means they were, the India was a granary for the industry in the in, 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 in United Kingdom. First, so we were suppliers of raw material. Our balance of trade was positive all through. It is only at a later stage, our, our share in the international trade was far, far higher than, more than 4% at that time. Today it is 0.4%. Now that probably indicates that something has gone wrong over the years. I think there is something wrong in the policy decisions, number one. The second thing is, as regards the quality of education is concerned, I must say that the focus in India is by the bureaucrats as well as the regulators is on infrastructure. You have buildings, do you have labs, do you have equipment, do you have typewriters, do you have computers, and not on the ability and the quality of teachers and the teaching. They don't focus, they don't bother. I remember, I read in the newspaper, 70 years old college, engineering college, government college in Jodhpur was placed in no admission zone by AICT. Seven most prominent, famous college. Well, that is the decision of the AICT. What I had, I had been done, probably they know better about it. I'm not questioning it. I'm only talking about infrastructure. 70 years college, which is a government college. If they don't get funds, what will they do? They don't have funds even to pay salaries at times. Let's go back to our own Shastras. We have Shastras, four Vedas. We have Upanishads, we have Shastras. And all those are produced not in big buildings, air conditioned houses. They were produced under the shade of trees in a forest. Why? The whole thing came through meditation. Whole thing came through knowledge. They acquired knowledge. They tried to reproduce. Nobody tried to claim authorship of any one of those Vedas or any one of those Shastras. I think that is the beauty of this country. We have missed it. Macaulay has spoiled it and destroyed it. I taught in the United States of America. It might look different. The people who are studying there, they have very narrow perspective of education. We are too much obsessed with American education. They don't know anything where India is. They don't know what are the resources of Indians. They don't know about the rest of the world. They are lost in their own country. They are developing skills. Of course, in their own area, they specialize very well. And they specialize to such an extent that they can produce very good results. They are excellent, not because of the education, but because of the systems United States or the European countries have created in terms of working conditions. Indians, when they go abroad, anywhere in the world, they perform extremely well because there exist systems where they can perform and they are not restricted. When you come back to the country, you do not have systems. You get lost in bureaucratic procedures rather than educating people. And I think what is necessary is that we need to have dedicated, passionate teachers with good quality, which we have not focused. Raw material is not. Raw material will go. I believe, last sentence I would say, I believe the country is very rich in terms of human resource, but we do not utilize it. We have always been, our bureaucracy always talked about one thing. Oh, we are overpopulated. No, that is the greatest resource. Karl Marx has said labor is the only factor of production. Why don't you use that 
all other resources are of no use whether it is capital whether it is natural resources whether it is mine whether it is gold mine it has no use unless there is a human resource to exploit that resource why can't we use this human resource properly we have never had any priority either for education for health for first 30 years after independence it was only a minister of state in the ministry of education and not a full fledged education ministry in the country that was the priority 3% of the education of the gdp is given to this now how do we expect at the at the school level it has been left to the school states who are themselves suffering from financial difficulties ever since i think we need to really have a real look we can create raw materials we can create finished product we can change as modi ji says make in india when this government was installed first time in 2014 i was on the lok sabha tv i said besides make in india we need to make we need to focus on made in india if we want to export goods we need to have made in india i find now in 2020 the government is talking about made in india you want to export you want to become self reliant then you have to have made in india and not only make in make in india will come i think we are there we need to really focus on education education is the one source which can make a country rich wealthy and also acceptable all over the world and also self reliant in full and fledged manner 35% is the rate of g 35% of the gdp is spent in japan on education we spend 3% nothing more than that thank you very much aman you now know why your father gd was considered the brightest in our group at delhi school thank you deepak you're so kind by far the brightest by far head and shoulders above the rest of us thank you i did not know this fact thank you for letting me know this fact uh, oh you have been a great debater i was always obsessed with your debating <laughs> always one first prize delhi <laughs> university Mahesh, sorry, anything you want to say? No. 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 Okay. Uh, sorry, we want to say something. Yeah. Yes. So, so, um, um, Ankita, what what you could do is you could just take my number with from Professor Aman, and uh, we have this good chamber called Asho Chamber. I represent IIF. on the managing committee of ashocham and i'll i'll put your problem of gloves there uh, we are connected uh, directly to or indirectly to almost 2 lakh uh, uh, companies and some company would come forward and make gloves so be assured that this webinar you would be able to get one supplier for your gloves right so that's the only point and my 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 coordinates are with professor and all yeah i would like to uh on this occasion now i like to thank everybody for joining us uh, thank you uh, all my guests from all over suri who's been there with us through the beginning till the end from singapore mahesh from hungary uh professor deepak vora uh, despite his schedule and commitments he's been off and on but he's been there throughout i know it very well i was surprised when he said he's leaving early because i know he never leaves me early ever he always is till the end. uh then uh, we're thankful to Osa, who was there, Dr. Chandrakant Pandev, uh, Dr. Halim Khan, uh, who has been there. Blossom was there. Her electricity went off, or something went wrong. That's why she could not continue. But then she has been there through. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Kiran Bedi, the Honorable uh, Lieutenant Governor of uh, Puducherry, to have come in, spare a time, and spoken to us. And everybody who has given, all the gurus who have given the words of wisdom to us. Thank you very much. Namaskar, Vande Matram, and Jai Hind. Thank you.